The Nephilim Saga in the Ancient Near East by Ishmael Ningish Zida. Chapter 1 The ancient Mesopotamian civilizations encompassed Sumer, 3500-1800 BCE, Akkad, 2340-2125 BCE, Babylonia, 2000-1000 BCE, and Assyria, 1170-612 BCE. These ancient societies produced a substantial quantity of written records on clay tablets using cuneiform script. Several of these artifacts have been conserved until the present time, despite some being in a state of disrepair or fragmentation. It is likely that others have been pilfered and are presently held in private ownership or stored in undisclosed places. Unfortunately, there have been instances where they have been utilized as construction materials for residential structures. The process of deciphering these texts began in the 19th century, allowing access to the valuable literature contained in the day tablets. As a result, a previously unfamiliar worldview emerged in contemporary society. One of the significant texts in our context is the Enuma Elish, a Babylonian creation story. It is named after its first two words, which mean when above. The story is written on seven tablets and provides insights into the creation of humans. I will provide a concise account of this creation narrative, making reference to multiple translations, which may vary in certain aspects and in some cases significantly. Early scholars assigned the Enuma Elish to a time period around 2000 BCE. Several contemporary authors propose a date that is approximately one millennium later. The precise date is yet to be determined. Official science dismisses these stories as mere folklore and mythologies that lack any factual basis in the universe. Due to the striking similarities with the initial books of the Old Testament, particularly Genesis, it is necessary to consider the book as purely mythological, as some individuals already do. Consequently, I will write using the hypothesis that the Mesopotamian stories may also be founded on factual realities. According to the Enuma Elish, Tiamat, the goddess, was the original mother of the gods. Apsu was their original progenitor, serving as the male counterpart to the female partner. Mumu, a personified power of creation, emerged from their union. By combining their energies, a lineage of deities spanning three generations was created. The initial entities in this sequence were the celestial duo Lahmu and Lahamu, from which Anshar and Kishar subsequently arose. Subsequently, a third lineage emerged consisting of Anu, a celestial deity, along with his two female partners and their offspring, Enlil, referred to as the ruler of tempests, and Enki, also known as the ruler of the earth, or Ea, or Nudimud, who also had their own female companions. Among them, a divine race known as the Anunnaki, or Anuna arose. Upon their emergence, the celestial siblings, Enlil and Enki, along with the other Anunnaki, agitated Apsu and Tiamat with their conduct. Despite Apsu's inability to appease them, Tiamat initially displayed strong resistance. Subsequently, Apsu summoned his advisor or chief minister, Mumu. They sought Tiamat's counsel at her abode. Their true intention was to eradicate these celestial siblings or, more precisely, undo their existence. Tiamat was enraged, as she considered herself their original mother and desired to kindly reprimand them. Nevertheless, Mumu encouraged Apsu to persist with the eradication, and Apsu was content. We must comprehend Apsu in two distinct ways. On one hand, he represents the original and fundamental energy from which creation emerged. On the other hand, he also embodies this energy in the form of a personified entity. Tiamat is commonly depicted as a primordial force, but she can also be interpreted as a manifestation of the feminine aspect of a single creator alongside the masculine aspect. These entities are frequently undervalued when they do not align with the prevailing worldview that recognizes them as deities. Enki uncovered their intentions and foiled their efforts. By employing enchantments, he successfully induced a state of slumber in both Apsu and Mumu, subsequently divesting Apsu of the symbols denoting his authority, 
ultimately resulting in his demise. Mumu was bound. Enki emerged victorious and proceeded to establish a world on Apsu, which he bestowed upon the Creator, signifying his act of constructing his own realm upon the foundation of the pre-existing creation. Enki appropriated a portion of the original energy. The domain of existence and authority of Enki is presently referred to as Apsu. The deity Marduk, renowned for his wisdom, originated from the union of Enki and his female consort, Damkina, also known as Damgalnuna. This deity, possessing four eyes and four ears, was destined to be the annihilator of Tiamat. He incessantly assailed her with waves, alternatively referred to as streams, turbulent surf, or deluge waves, and, curiously, in one German translation as reed swamp, which inadequately captures the forceful nature of the assault. Several deities currently possess malevolent intentions. Tiamat is accused of being passive and is challenged to engage in combat. Tiamat readies herself. A division among the gods occurred, with certain deities aligning themselves with Marduk, while others sided with Tiamat, who had previously given birth to them. Tiamat creates impregnable armaments, including formidable serpents adorned with razor-sharp fangs and venomous bodies to safeguard herself in the imminent clash. She summons malevolent yet divine dragons, instilling terror with their mere presence. An assemblage of creatures is gathered. A hydra dragon, a demon, also known as Lahamu, a ferocious dog, a lion man, a scorpion man, tempest demons, and others. A total of eleven types of monsters emerge, with Kingu, Tiamat's firstborn, assuming the role of their leader and becoming Tiamat's new partner. This phenomenon involves the division of the initially consolidated energies of Apsu and Tiamat. Enki becomes aware of these preparations and experiences, fear. He informs Anshar, causing a great disturbance, and he asks Enki to calm Tiamat. Given that Enki has already eliminated Apsu, Anshar desires for him to eliminate Kingu as well. He acknowledges Tiamat's power and requests that he dispatch another entity to confront her. Anshar subsequently directs his attention towards Anu, who initially expresses a desire to engage in diplomatic discussions with Tiamat, but subsequently retreats due to her readiness to engage in combat. The Anunnaki, the inhabitants of Anu, are experiencing a state of concern. Enki summons Marduk to his chamber and commands him to engage in combat, to which Marduk eagerly agrees. With all of his ally deities marching by his side, Marduk moves closer to Tiamat. Tiamat emits a fierce and forceful roar, while Marduk charges her with instigating conflict due to her excessive self-importance and arrogance, as well as inciting discord through secretive plotting. Under the sway of her influence, Sons would have unjustly mistreated their fathers, while she would have harboured Basile's animosity towards her own children. She would have actively pursued malevolence. Marduk reverses the situation. He provokes her to engage in combat, resulting in her demise. It is clearly implausible that Marduk and his group could have perpetrated the extermination of the original creators and the annihilation of the entire universe. Furthermore, it would have resulted in self-destruction for them. Hence, the essence of the matter lies in their act of forsaking the creators and proclaiming their demise to the Anunnaki, thereby choosing to live as if the creators were non-existent. Thus, they established a distinct domain within the vast expanse of the universe, akin to an isolated enclave where they resided in solitude. Therefore, we should infer the existence of a fundamental truth underlying the narrative rather than dismissing it as a mere legend. It is reasonable to infer the existence of additional regions in the universe apart from the Anunnaki enclave. This could account for the presence of additional celestial entities, or extraterrestrial beings, that were not explicitly referenced in the ancient Mesopotamian texts and likely remained unfamiliar to the Mesopotamians. Initially, there were deviant deities among those that originated from Apsu and Tiamat. Tiamat desired to exhibit maternal tolerance towards them, whereas Apsu sought to eradicate them in order to reinstate order and tranquility. 
Subsequently, the instigators orchestrated a revolution and seized control through acts of violence and homicide. This narrative bears resemblance to the well-known tale of Satan and the angels who rebelled against him. Tiamat, fully convinced of the necessity to engage in combat, was ready to intervene and protect herself. Which side is malevolent, then? One text discusses the evil plan devised by Mumu and Apsu to eliminate the divine troublemakers. It states that Tiamat pondered the evil in her heart, alternatively translated as lamented in her heart, restrained the evil in her abdomen, despaired over the evil plans, and uttered a curse when she initially rejected this plan. Conversely, Enki commits the act of killing his grandfather and orchestrates the demise of his grandmother, the two original deities who are regarded as the progenitors of the entire universe. Subsequently, Marduk assumes dominion over the entire world, assuming the role of the deity presiding over our planet and ultimately ascending to the position of the primary deity of Babylon. It appears that economists and theologians are unquestioningly adopting the perspective of their followers when discussing good and evil. However, to the discerning reader, Enki, Anshar, and Marduk may indeed be perceived as the true perpetrators. Do they possess the characteristics of divine underworld enforcers who seize control of a portion of Apsu's domain through their cleverness and acts of violence? Subsequently, the Anunnaki arrived on Earth and fabricated human beings by genetically modifying pre existing life forms rather than engaging in genuine creation from primordial energy. Here, like in other instances, I occasionally enclose the term create in quotation marks because genuine creation materializes something from the original energy that did not exist previously. Therefore, producing something by manipulating pre existing structures does not constitute genuine creation in the same manner. Enlil and Enki were the primary deities who assumed control over our planet. Therefore, the Mesopotamian religion can be considered not strictly polytheistic, as it recognizes only one deity who is designated as the original creator. However, this deity has two distinct aspects, one male, Apsu, and one female. Tiamat, making it somewhat androgynous. The other deities are subordinate, intermediary entities positioned between the ultimate divine and humanity. Similarly, we can consider Christianity, which encompasses God the Father, Christ the Holy Spirit, Mary, and numerous angels, as being at least comparable, particularly when considering the worship of saints. Ethnologists and linguists have provided compelling evidence that the Bible, specifically Genesis and certain sections of the Pentateuch, can be traced back to Mesopotamian texts that were altered and condensed. The first sentence in Genesis holds great significance as it succinctly refers to the creation of heaven and earth. The subsequent section of this book will explore the concept of human's origin, and later on it will delve into a distinct interpretation of the mentioned waters. The Enuma Elish provides a more elaborate account of the initial creation preceding the events described in the Bible, thus containing a section that is absent in the biblical narrative. Theologians and rabbis who refuse to perceive it in this manner are simply employing strategies to safeguard their positions. Morhen states that Enki is the father of Enlil, contrary to the commonly held belief that they are brothers. Enlil deliberately deceived others in order to appear on the same level as his father. Morhen holds a contrasting viewpoint to the general agreement on Enki and Enlil, but the quote, Enlil, may the father who gave you life, Enki, with Ninki Damkina, say a prayer on my behalf, seems to provide evidence in favor of Morhen's opinion. The translation of this quotation needs to be clarified. Additionally, Enlil is identified as the progenitor of Enki in another text, therefore this question still needs to be solved. Regardless, Enlil, known as the Deity of Fury, harbors no affection for the human species but rather holds it in contempt. He regards humans as mere animals. Enki is occasionally depicted as a serpent, possibly due to his profound wisdom.
the omniscient deity possesses the esoteric wisdom that mortals are not meant to acquire. However, by violating this prohibition, he has divulged specific information to humans. Consequently, he exhibits a friendly demeanor towards humans. The deities aiding Tiamat made an attempt to flee, but they were apprehended, and their weaponry was annihilated. Marduk fractured the cranium of Tiamat and severed her circulatory system. He allowed the northern wind to transport her skull, alternatively referred to as her blood, to faraway lands, causing the gods aligned with him to celebrate. He dismembered the remaining body, similar to how a fish is prepared for drying. He allowed half of it to condense into a cloud in the sky. He stretched out her skin and appointed a guardian to prevent her water, energy, from leaking. From the opposite side, he created Eshara, which is the terrestrial realm. He constructed dwellings for the mighty deities on Earth. Marduk established the zodiac in the celestial sphere and partitioned the annual cycle into 12 months. He proclaimed Nibiru as the dwelling place of the deities who proclaim their responsibilities. Ultimately, he established the moon's trajectory on its designated path. He established the Earth's orbit around the sun and the moon's orbit around the Earth. This encompasses the determination of the zodiac, the lunar motion, and the subdivision of the year into months. The deities responsible for these events were the Anunnaki, with Anu, the god of the heavens, and Enki's father being their supreme deity. A significant number of individuals regard Nibiru as their place of residence, the genesis of the human species. Marduk, the deity from the Enuma Elish, declared his intention to create a human being by using blood and bones. This human, known as man, would be tasked with serving the gods in order to provide them with rest. As a consequence of Kingu's instigation of Tiamat's conflict, he was executed and humanity was fashioned from his blood and bones. Additional clay tablets provide further insights into the process of human creation. Another method of creation is described in which the goddess of birth, Ninhursag, also known as Mani, Nintu, or Bele'ili, is assigned. The humans were tasked with cultivating and irrigating the fields in order to yield abundant crops for the Anunnaki. In addition, they were expected to commemorate the festivals of the deities and maintain livestock such as oxen, sheep, cattle, fish, and poultry. Other tablets state that humans were created to serve the gods without possessing autonomy, enslaved by the deities, an earthly haven. 300 Anunnaki assumed the role of celestial observers. An additional 300 individuals were designated to serve on Earth. The latter are referred to as Igigi. However, it is necessary to specify precisely which Anunnaki group is referred to as Igigi. In Babylon, a towering temple named Esagila was constructed, featuring dedicated areas for Marduk, Enlil, and Enki. The Anunnaki erected altars for their own worship. Anu, Marduk's grandfather, appointed him in a dictatorial manner as the god of humans. Nibiru refers to a hypothetical celestial object that some people believe exists and is said to have a significant impact on Earth. The Benuma Blish refers to Nibiru in Tablet 5, specifically on line 6. It is worth noting that some translators may write it as Nibiru or Neberu. Translators in different languages have translated this with various names, including Polister, Jupiter, Mercury, the axis of the universe, the one who captures the center, the one who captures Tiamat in the center, the planet of transition or crossing or it remains untranslated. In Tablet 7, specifically in lines 124-9, Nibiru is described as a celestial body that governs the transition between the celestial realm and the earthly realm. It is referred to as the Star of Marduk. The following quotations, sourced from various translations and versions, in English, German and French, encompass all the information provided by the Benuma Blish regarding Nibiru. The content enclosed in brackets comprises discrepancies among these translations. 
notably the significantly divergent word selections. The individual established the annual divisions by utilizing signs, specifically constellations of the zodiac. For each of the 12 months, he assigned three stars. Additionally, he determined the positions of Nibiru in order to establish the interconnections between the stars, marking out their course and fixing the distance between them. To prevent any errors, negligence, transgressions or laziness, he established the stations of Enlil and Enki, along with Nibiru. He unlocked gates on both sides and secured them with sturdy bolts on the left and right. He positioned the zenith, which refers to the highest regions of the sky, within Tiamat's abdomen, specifically in the centre, her liver, and the celestial dome. He unequivocally established the conclusion and the commencement, shall maintain the commencement and the future, is the guardian of all nations. May Nibiru, the celestial body that controls the space between heaven and earth, maintain its position as the guardian of the celestial and underworld realms, ensuring the stability of its orbit. The gods should neither ascend nor descend, but rather await his arrival and pay him homage. He built Nibiru, a celestial body, to produce light in the sky. It is desired that Nibiru assume its designated place on the celestial ladder, allowing it to be visible and revered while maintaining its existence from start to finish. The individual who persistently traverses the sea without ceasing shall be known as Nibiru, the one who exercises dominion over the central region of Tiamat. May he maintain the trajectory of the celestial bodies and guide all deities as if they were sheep. May he successfully overcome Tiamat and pose a significant threat to her existence, ultimately leading to her demise. Nora Romney's interpretation slightly deviates from the norm by referring to Nibiru as the central figure of the cosmos who traversed the celestial sphere ceaselessly. Nevertheless, I do not concur with her portrayal of Apsu as pleasant water, or Tiamat as unpleasant water. Nor do I align with certain other elements in her interpretation that she conveys in accordance with prevailing scholarly consensus. The substance referred to as water is, in fact, a form of energy, as previously mentioned. However, the limited perspective of mainstream science is unable to comprehend such forms of energy. Thus, it is postulated that Tiamat represents the vast expanse of the sea, or saline water, as opposed to bitter water, whereas Apsu symbolizes the fresh water found in the rivers of Mesopotamia. Both entities undoubtedly play a crucial role in maintaining life on our planet. Apsu was initially translated as abyss, although this interpretation was considered less credible. The previous tablets of the Enuma Elish which opine that she would have already passed away, strangely suggests that Tiamat's life was brief and constantly in danger. A translation by Gerald Donovan states, Nibiru is responsible for guarding the celestial passages between heaven and earth, as anyone who cannot find the gateway above or below always seeks guidance from Nibiru. Nibiru is the visible star associated with Marduk. It takes its position at the turning point, allowing observers to identify it and proclaim, whoever crosses the treacherous sea, Tiamat, without rest, shall be named Nibiru, for they conquer its center. It is imperative to maintain the unaltered course of the stars in the sky. The notable discrepancies in the various versions highlight the challenges faced by translators in interpreting these passages. The blending of Tiamat as both a sea and an entity is somewhat ambiguous, introducing uncertainty that may have already existed in the original text. Very few individuals seem to have addressed the inquiries regarding the location of a passage and the precise location of the middle of the sea designated to Tiamat. How would one go about crossing this area? Is Nibiru monitoring that passage, and is it only possible to cross with its authorization? Nibiru, also known as a star or planet, is often associated with the dwelling place of the Anunnaki. Zechariah Sitchin, in his book The Twelfth Planet, referred to it as the Twelfth Planet, named Marduk. This is because ancient civilizations considered the moon and the sun to be planets, resulting in a count of eleven known planets. 
Sitchin later introduced the term Nibiru in subsequent books. However, mainstream science has consistently criticized Sitchin's interpretation of Mesopotamian texts. How can we form a well-informed opinion on this matter? Official astronomy has long speculated about the existence of a planet beyond Neptune, referred to as Planet X, which could explain certain anomalies in the orbits of the outer planets. There are also theories about a star called Nemesis, which is believed to be a brown dwarf and orbits the Sun at a great distance from the known planets. It is speculated that Nemesis may have its own planets. Another hypothetical planet is Taishi, and yet another is Hercolobus, which, if it existed, would have caused natural catastrophes when it came close to Earth in ancient times due to its gravitational effects. This hypothetical planet is also referred to as the Destroyer, or Wormwood, in reference to a star mentioned in the Book of Revelation, 811. In 2005, a small planet beyond Neptune called Eris, previously known as Xena, was discovered, and it has a moon named Dysnomia. Sitchin's theory would be more acceptable if he did not propose that the Anunnaki resided on a twelfth planet. This viewpoint is considered taboo in the scientific community, as it may lead to ridicule and jeopardize one's professional standing. Mainstream science does not acknowledge the existence of extraterrestrials, let alone advanced alien civilizations. According to Sitchin, Nibiru follows a long elliptical orbit, similar to that of a comet. It takes approximately 3,600 years for Nibiru to complete one revolution around the Sun. In ancient times, Nibiru would have entered our solar system from an unknown location in space and remained here. This aligns with a particular description of Nibiru in an alternative translation mentioned earlier. The one who traversed the sky ceaselessly is now at the center of the universe. Enuma Elish characterizes Nibiru as luminous. Hebrew exhibits connections to certain Mesopotamian languages. In Jacenius's Hebrew lexicon, the term Nibirash, denoting to emit light, to radiate, is referenced as one of its meanings. An unused root refers to a word that is not commonly used. A word with a similar meaning is hell, which can also be referred to as the shining one or the bringer of light. In the Latin translation of the Bible, this word is translated as Lucifer. These connections between words could lead to speculation. It's fair that Moorhen criticizes Sitchin's theory because it lacks support from sources other than the limited information in the Enuma Elish and doesn't answer any questions that have been raised about it. From my perspective, Sitchin deliberately omitted crucial details from the Enuma Elish specifically the deicides, the killing of Apsu and Tiamat by their own creations. Suppose we approach the Enuma Elish with a reasonable level of seriousness, as we are doing here. In that case, this controversial information holds great significance as it relates to the rebellion of a corresponding portion of creation, a literal descent of the angels, and an original sin, the sin of separation. Sitchin has yet to acknowledge the existence of these aspects. Sitchin's hypothesis regarding Nibiru has resulted in a surge of online content. It is a common occurrence for individuals to claim that they have yet to witness Nibiru resembling a second sun or any other celestial body in the sky. While videos and images have been shared, some of them have probably been digitally altered. I have never experienced such an observation and without personal verification, this evidence is questionable. Furthermore, various calculations determine the orbit and position of Nibiru in the sky, as well as its projected future approach to Earth. However, these calculations differ significantly and cannot be reconciled. This does not necessarily imply that such a planet does not exist, but rather suggests that many individuals are fabricating their own reports or spreading disinformation. Previously, I held a higher regard for Sitchin's theories compared to my current perspective, although even back then, I did not fully agree with all of his writings. Nevertheless, these theories have the potential to provide an alternative interpretation of certain Bible passages diverging from conventional beliefs. Several of these theories will be examined later on. In summary, 
while some of his theories are remarkable, it is advisable to approach them with skepticism. Interpreting the Enuma Elish and other Mesopotamian texts as suggesting an extraterrestrial influence on humanity does not inherently contain any logical contradictions. However, this perspective may be considered taboo within the scientific community, leading to emotional reactions rather than logical refutations. According to Moorhen, the dwelling place of the gods is not Nibiru, but rather Duku, a sacred hill. However, this is only after they arrive on Earth. The question then arises, did they come from a celestial Duku? The term Marduk, Yu, can be interpreted as either the protector or the son of Duku. Additionally, there is a mountain range or raised land outside of the Mesopotamian plain called Karsag or Hursag, which is also referred to as Duku. Some believe that the town of Karsag is the original model for the Garden of Eden. However, it is important to note that in Sumerian, Karsag means mountain in general and is not the name of a specific mountain. The oldest religious text in Mesopotamia is said to originate from this area. It is written on a cylinder known as the Barton Cylinder, named after its discoverer, George Anton Barton, who first translated it in 1918. Moorhen, please provide an interpretive translation of the initial segment of this text. They arrived with great force from a realm outside of time. They were transported at some point by the uprising, exact word unknown, of the cosmos. The nourishment provided by Enlil's food would bestow vitality on them. The lady serpent, Sir Ninma and Ninkasag, made a plea on behalf of someone, as she had granted them a favour that would ensure their survival. In contrast, Barton translated this passage as follows. He emerged. He came from Kesh, from Enlil. The nourishment of Enlil grants him life. Regarding Sir, there is a proclamation. She bestows favour. She sustains all existence. It is necessary to ascertain the origin of Moorhen's acquisition of all the other words. Kesh was a Sumerian city. However, Moorhen argues that the original meaning of the word was the universe or the rest of the world. He describes Enlil as Shazam, a Sumerian term that he interprets as territorial administrator. Moorhen explains that there is a Sumerian character that can be translated as either Lul, Liar, or Sham, and he chooses the latter. At this point, he delves into the identity of Satan and mistakenly claims a connection to the Hebrew word Satan, which he asserts means hate or pursue, although its actual meaning is stop, prevent, or snare. I will revisit this topic later. Enlil is also referred to as Lord who came from the night and of our men of well drilling, and Lord of the storm and our men of the pickaxe. Moorhen's translation refers to the diseases that were deliberately inflicted upon humans as a means of reducing their population, as they had gained unauthorized entry into the Garden of the Gods, likely with the assistance of Enki. However, Enki made considerable efforts to create a remedy in the form of an alcoholic beverage, possibly an herbal tincture, or a beer produced from fermented fruits and herbs. According to Moorhen, the gods migrated to Duku due to a cosmic rebellion originating from a realm outside of time. This aligns with Sitchin's hypothesis that Nibiru, a celestial object from beyond our solar system, is the home of these gods. The phrase Enlil came from the night may allude to the interstellar darkness. While there is some uncertainty, this theory is appropriately situated and merits careful consideration. It is unsurprising that Moorhen, like Sitchin, has faced significant criticism for his translations and interpretations, and has been accused of spreading false information by proponents of the classical perspective. It is natural for one side to defend their viewpoint and belittle those who do not conform to it. However, I find much of Moorhen's criticism to be valid. As is often the case, the truth likely lies somewhere in the middle. Readers can form their own conclusions by referring to Endnote 20, despite it being in French. In any case, 
Moorhen's translations are excessively verbose and subjective, often being much longer than conventional translations and containing words not found in other versions. Chapter 2 Tiamat Sitchin posits that the asteroid belt is the celestial ceiling. The Titius Bode law, an empirical rule in astronomy, explains the origin of this belt. The equation Rn Waru 4 plus 3.2n, where Rn is the average radius of a planetary orbit and n is the number of planets starting from Venus but excluding the Sun, represents this law. For instance, Venus corresponds to n and 0 and Earth to n Amphrazos 1. However, when n amber 3, there is a gap between Mars and Jupiter. It is expected to find a planet in this position, but instead, there is a vast collection of asteroids, rocks, and stones known as the asteroid belt. Some propose that these objects could be remnants of a hypothetical planet named Malona or Phaeton that disintegrated. Present day astronomy offers alternative explanations and has distanced itself from this theory, but it remains a topic of interest due to its plausibility. Sitchin argues that a planet named Tiamat was on a collision course with Nibiru due to Nibiru's elongated elliptical orbit, which intersects with the orbits of other planets, referred to as the planet of crossing. He interprets the mythical conflict between Marduk, Nibiru, and Tiamat as an actual physical collision, where the moon of Nibiru shattered Tiamat into fragments. Approximately half of Tiamat's remains formed the asteroid belt, while the other half was ejected from its orbit and eventually became Earth, Ishara. If we consider the Enuma Elish as more than a mere myth and entertain Sitchin's assertion that Nibiru was, and still is, inhabited by the Anunnaki, we may question whether the planet Tiamat was also inhabited. In such a scenario, it is possible that each population attempted to safeguard themselves by altering the orbit of the other planet, or, if necessary, annihilating it. The reason behind Sitchin's designation of the planet as Tiamat remains unclear, but it is plausible that it housed a civilization originating from a distinct region of creation, which did not align with the renegade Anunnaki from the other enclave. This situation can be likened to two separate political factions, with one being oriented towards Tiamat. Moorhen, however, contends that Nibiru was the moon of the obliterated planet Phaeton, Tiamat. This assertion is not in line with the planet's destruction. It is perplexing how it could have been fragmented. Consequently, Sitchin's theory of a collision aligns more coherently. One thing that representatives of official science will find disagreeable is the claim that the ancient Anunnaki were more advanced technologically than we are today, at least in regard to their mastery of space travel and their ability to manipulate life forms genetically. How could that be possible? One answer is the fact that our universe is, beyond any doubt, multidimensional. Present-day physics acknowledges that the cosmos has more than the three dimensions that we humans on Earth can perceive with our limited sensory organs. Was this limitation genetically engineered into us? If the universe has many more than these three dimensions, it is not far-fetched to think that there may also be multidimensional life forms there. If the Anunnaki were, for example, five-dimensional beings, they would be able to do things we could not even imagine. That would also explain how they could live on a planet that would be uninhabitable for us three-dimensionally because it spends very long periods in a cosmic night and is far from the sun. Is it possible for Nibiru to be our moon? If we entertain the notion that these deities possess the ability to traverse outer space, Nibiru could be perceived as a celestial outpost situated within the Sea of Tiamat, the expanse between planets, functioning as a mobile frontier guard that regulates the transit between Earth and extraterrestrial realms. It is conceivable that Nibiru is of sufficient magnitude to manifest as a discernible celestial body akin to a star. Alternatively, could Nibiru serve as a support facility for our moon? Could the moon be the moon itself, or is it something else entirely? In 1978, two Russian scientists 
Michael Yassin, and Alexander Sherbakov, proposed a theory suggesting that the Moon might actually be a hollowed-out planetoid functioning as a colossal spacecraft. This hypothesis could account for the peculiar characteristics observed in this celestial body. Interestingly, such a proposition aligns with the depiction found in the Enuma Elish. The Anunnaki may be present on both the Moon and Planet X. Presently, there is growing evidence suggesting the existence of Planet X, although it is challenging to discern reliable evidence from unreliable evidence. However, the description of Nibiru in the Enuma Elish aligns more closely with the Moon. The hypothesis of Planet X aligns poorly with the limited information provided in the Enuma Elish, as Planet X is not mentioned in that text. The passage discusses traversing the celestial body known as Tiamat and its central region. The term C may refer to the expanse within our solar system, while the middle of Tiamat alludes to the asteroid belt, which originated within our planetary system from a planet associated with Tiamat. The question arises as to whether the journey through this area, the middle of Tiamat, is from planet X towards our location or vice versa. This notion also prompts consideration of Nibiru as the planet Jupiter, Marduk's planet, which could potentially serve as a watcher within or near that particular region in space. Viewed from different perspectives, Nibiru and planet X are distinct entities, although the existence of the latter cannot be ruled out. Both coexist, leading to ambiguity in their identification. However, it is noteworthy that Sitchin was the first to equate the two. Information regarding the origin of humankind The Sumerian clay tablets describe two forms of human creation. The first involves the emergence of humanoid animals from the earth at a specific location known as Uzumwa, where they lacked the knowledge of consuming bread, wearing clothes and walking on their hands and feet while eating grass like sheep. Another myth suggests that humans sprouted from the blood of slaughtered gods at the same location, potentially connecting the two forms of creation. This transition marked the shift from an animalistic state to the emergence of true humans who engaged in farming after receiving the breath of life, possibly referring to the acquisition of souls. The second form of creation, which Sitchin believes to be a genetic intervention by the gods, is explained in greater detail below. In the text Atrahasis, it is mentioned that the Igigi, a group of gods, were subjected to arduous labor. After 40 years, they revolted and destroyed their tools. They then approached Enlil and threatened him with the prospect of war. The labor they were assigned was excessively difficult, and they now sought a resolution with Enlil. Enki proposed the creation of humans to bear the burden. Belet Ili, a goddess associated with childbirth and known by various names such as Mani, Nintu, or Ninma, was tasked with this endeavor. The gods combined clay with the blood and flesh of a sacrificed god. Fourteen selected goddesses were designated to carry this mixture to term. After a gestation period of ten months, fourteen children were born seven with male and seven with female characteristics. They became the first laborers, referred to as Lulu. Henceforth, their population was to increase through the physical union of man and woman. These humans, designed for enslavement, possessed black hair on their heads. Hence, they were also referred to as blackheads. The term clay, mentioned here, refers to a substance that the gods obtained from the region known as Abzu. In this context, Abzu could potentially refer to Enki's temple, where there was a presence of holy water believed to possess special energies. The clay, in this interpretation, may serve as a medium for a genetic process. It is worth noting that genes are present in both blood and flesh, even when they originate from an individual of Anunnaku descent. Given that the term Anunnaki denotes a collective group of gods, it is inherently plural and for simplicity I will use Anunnaku as a singular form. The initial phase of the process encountered obstacles, as some of the humans exhibited physical impairments, as described in the texts of Enki and Ninma. During the preliminary trials, 
There was a man unable to utilize his arms, another unable to close his eyes, a third with paralyzed feet, an individual suffering from incontinence, a sterile woman, and a sexless being. This outcome left the birth goddess disappointed. However, Enki intervened and proposed the injection of a man's ejaculate into a woman's womb. Unfortunately, this resulted in the creation of a disabled human. The subsequent events, spanning approximately ten lines, are missing from the tablet. Nevertheless, the gods eventually succeeded in obtaining their human labor force. The Igigi and later humans were primarily engaged in the construction of irrigation canals, including those for the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, as well as other water sources. The soil excavated during this process was piled up to form mountains. Additionally, Sitchin argues that they were also involved in mining for gold. This gold was intended to be dispersed as fine particles in their planet's atmosphere, serving to reduce heat loss, similar to the effect of a thermos bottle. According to Sitchin, Nibiru experiences a cooling period during its distant orbit away from the sun. Furthermore, he suggests that gold held a significant value for the gods as an elixir of life although its worth in terms of wealth was not the same as it is for humans, or humans may have come to value it due to demand from the Anunnaki. Flood The Akkadian myth of the flood, known as Atra Hasis, recounts Enlil's malevolent actions towards humans. Enlil harboured disdain for them due to their increasing population and boisterous nature. In an effort to diminish their numbers, he commanded the infliction of diseases and droughts upon them. However, unsatisfied with the results, he devised a plan to wipe them out completely through a catastrophic deluge. Enlil explicitly prohibited Enki from warning the humans about this impending disaster, but Enki defied his command through a clever strategy. Enki addressed a barrier made of reeds, ensuring that Atrahasis could perceive his words. Escape from your dwelling, construct a vessel, abandon your belongings, and preserve a life. Enki provided detailed instructions on the boat's construction. Atra Hasis communicated with the gathering of esteemed individuals. My deity holds a conflicting viewpoint from yours. Enki and Enlil perpetually harbor animosity towards one another. I have been banished from the territory. Due to my perpetual remorse for Enki, I am unable to reside in your town. I am unable to step foot on the land belonging to Enlil. The ship was constructed, and a variety of animals were brought on board, their DNA preserved in a genetic bank. Atrahasis's family also joined him. Atrahasis experienced intense sadness and physical distress, vomiting bile. The weather shifted, and the storm, God Adad, unleashed his fury in the clouds. Atrahasis sealed the door of the ship with pitch and a loosely attached anchor. A massive flood ensued, causing complete darkness and obscuring the sun. The people were unable to recognize each other amidst the catastrophic event. After seven days, it became possible to disembark, and Atrahasis made a sacrificial offering to the gods. The deities experienced hunger due to the absence of farmers and the lack of offerings. The prominent mother goddess expressed her deep sorrow over the inept decisions made by Enlil and Anu, as well as the large number of deceased bodies in the rivers. Enki acknowledged his assistance in ensuring the survival of humans and successfully persuaded Enlil to embrace a more effective strategy. Upon learning of Atrahasis's escape, Enki and Nintu devised a plan to control the population by imposing restrictions on childbirth. In order to limit population growth, it was necessary for some children to die and for celibacy to be enforced. A female demon named Pasitu, also known as Lamashtu, similar to Lilith in Hebrew mythology, was tasked with taking newborn children from their mothers. Additionally, measures were taken to narrow the birth canal, resulting in a decrease in successful births for approximately one-third of women. Consequently, Many women were compelled to live a monastic lifestyle. In a condensed flood myth, Atrahasis is referred to as Zeusudra. 
The renowned Gilgamesh epic narrates a similar tale, with the protagonist named Utnapishtim. This passage recounts another narrative involving Enlil's malevolence. Enlil had created a colossal being named Humbaba, who governed a vast cedar forest and was complicit in the wickedness of the inhabitants of the land. To liberate the people from this pernicious influence, the hero Gilgamesh, accompanied by his comrade Enkidu, slays the giant. Despite Enlil himself orchestrating the conflict, likely with the hope of Gilgamesh's demise, he decreed that one of the two friends should perish as punishment. Enkidu fell ill and met his demise, leaving Gilgamesh in profound mourning. The epic also recounts Enlil's fury upon learning that humans have managed to survive the deluge. Have any of these mortals managed to elude destruction? None were meant to have survived the devastation. Enki subsequently addressed him. Most knowledgeable among deities, valiant Enlil, how could you recklessly unleash the flood? The Sumerian Tree of Knowledge Moorhen, in his translations of Sumerian texts, suggests that the tree of knowledge and its fruits can be understood as tools. This is because the Sumerian word for tree, gish, can also mean tool. For example, a tool like a knife or an axe has a wooden handle, similar to a tree branch, while the metal head can be seen as the fruit. This interpretation plays on the similarity between two Sumerian words, buru, tool, plundering, and buru, fruit of a tree. According to Moorhen, Enki's teachings to humans included the knowledge of a tool called a chisel. This made the gods anxious because they saw the potential for the tool to be used as a weapon. The gods also expressed dissatisfaction with Enki's influence on humans, as they believed that humans were becoming too comfortable and developing a taste for luxury. Enki's teachings had the effect of improving the fate of humans each time, so the gods considered it a grave betrayal when he imparted knowledge of working with metals to them. Moorhen argues that other translations also support the notion that the gods were greatly concerned about humans possessing the skill of metallurgy. However, the connection between a tree and its fruit with metallic tools certainly seems implausible. In my view, the gods' concern would have a much wider context than merely the use of a knife or an axe, especially in relation to the tree of knowledge, according to Moorhen, the tree of penetration. Comparisons with other translations of relevant texts indicate that the translation metal is not without alternatives. No other translation of the texts would support this interpretation. They all differ remarkably from Moorhen's version, and the word metal is found in none of them. Since, to my mind, there is a lack of logic in Moorhen's understanding, I consider it a mistake to regard the secret of the gods as knowledge about metallurgy. As an illustration, Moorhen's translation of the Sumerian tablet CBS 8322 which Barton published, yields a completely different understanding. Moorhen's version is, again, very wordy and contains many words that need to be found somewhere in Barton's edition. Even though Barton calls this text enigmatic, there is no reason to understand it the way Moorhen does. Here, the text is more enigmatic than it becomes in Moorhen's interpretation. The Tree of Wisdom Moorhen claims that the tree of knowledge in the Bible is referred to as Etz Yada, page 191 in the French text, spelled as Etz Jada in both versions, whereas in the Hebrew text in Genesis, it is actually called Etz Hadat. The true significance of this is the tree of wisdom. The verb Yadav, to know, aligns more appropriately with his alternate understanding of the Sumerian text as a tree of penetration which he links to a penetrating tool, such as a knife. The verb yadav encompasses two distinct meanings, one, to possess knowledge, and two, to engage in sexual intercourse involving penetration. In Genesis 4.1, it is stated that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. However, it is important to note that the term da'at, knowledge, is not explicitly used in this context. The Bible does not mention an etz yada, tree of knowledge. The term da'at 
does not possess an alternative meaning of sexual union or any form of penetration, except perhaps in the sense of acquiring forbidden knowledge. Throughout history, it has been politically advantageous to argue that this tree is connected to sexuality, but da'at does not carry such a secondary meaning. Consequently, the biblical context suggests that Yahweh prohibited the pursuit of knowledge. Humans were not meant to possess excessive knowledge, particularly regarding certain secrets. In other non-Sumerian clay tablets, the narrative may differ slightly, as some texts indicate that Enki did teach Adam and Eve about reproduction, but without any prohibition. Furthermore, there is no association with a tree. This topic will be further discussed below. It is worth noting that Enki is commonly referred to as the deity of wisdom. Is the subject matter truly centered around a prohibition on engaging with him? There is a widely held belief that the Anunnaki are reptilian beings. Numerous images and sculptures from Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt depict humanoid figures with animal heads, some of which could be interpreted as reptilian with a little imagination. Some of these figures are also depicted with wings. For instance, there is an image from the museum in Baghdad that shows a figure with scales, although this interpretation is speculative. Additionally, there is a group of gods known as the Four Apkalu, who are described as amphibious beings with fish-like bodies. In the 3rd century BCE, the Babylonian historian Barossos wrote a history of the Babylonians in Greek, in which he mentions a god named Oannes. Oannes is described as having the body of a fish with human legs and feet, and he taught many things to humans. The question about the age at which these beings could live creates a puzzling archaeological problem and quite a headache for ethnologists. There is a tablet with a list of the Sumerian kings that states their ruling periods using the time unit Shah. The first king on the list, Alulim, ruled eight Shahs or Shahs. A Shah is approximately equal to 3,600 years, so that king would have ruled 28,800 years. The longest rule given is for Enmenlu Ana 12 Shahs or 43,200 years. That cannot be. It appears that equating a Shah with 3,600 years goes back to Barossos, who indiscriminately handed down this information from much older sources unknown to us. The meaning of Shah is, in any case, controversial among experts. In cuneiform writing, the word Shah is in this context, it is different in other contexts, represented by a solid circle, possibly also with an empty circle zero, signifying a revolution or cycle, but also world, all, and entirety. Is this the length of Nibiru's orbit? That is how Sitchin and others see it. A Shah cannot be an Earth year. However, since then, all these kings would have ruled for short periods only. Therefore, we must leave it undecided what revolution may mean here. Jupiter is regarded as Marduk's planet and has a revolution period of 12 years. Could this be the Shah? Then, the ruling time of Alulim would be 96 years, which is much more plausible. A Shah is 3,600 days, that is, less than 10 years. This is a speculative oversimplification, even though it does result in plausible periods. Another potential explanation is mentioned in Suda, also known as Suidas, an anonymous Greek encyclopedia from the 10th century CE. According to the Chaldeans, a Shah referred to a period of 222 lunar months equivalent to 18.5 years. A lunar month, or synodic month, represents the time between two full moons or new moons. It is said that 223 lunar months correspond to the time between two lunar eclipses. While there are other related concepts and definitions, such as the Saros cycle, which is similar but not identical, we do not need to delve into the intricate details and theories of Chaldean and Babylonian astronomy here. This cycle could support the notion that Nibiru could be our moon. Consequently, this explanation also yields plausible lengths of reign. Harrison, in a mathematically unsophisticated manner, calculates peculiarly and ultimately arrives back at the original values in Shah's, albeit with a new interpretation. 
A shah is a unit of time that can also be used in different contexts with different numerical values. When used as a pure number, a share is equal to 602, which is equivalent to 3,600. However, when used as a measure of time, the word shah could have a different meaning. In this case, its meaning as a pure number has been arbitrarily applied to its value as a time unit. The cuneiform character for shah may represent the concept of a cycle, but it needs to be clarified which specific cycle it refers to. One plausible hypothesis is that it could be referring to moon months. Furthermore, it is worth noting that the Mesopotamian cultures utilized a numerical system that was based on the number 60. In contrast, because we have five fingers on each of our two hands, our own numerical system is based on the concept of 2 times 5, which equals 10. The Mesopotamians, on the other hand, counted on their fingers up to 45, which became somewhat intricate due to the limitation of having only five fingers. However, if they had an additional finger, making it a total of six, a numerical system based on 60 would have been more convenient. This raises the question of whether the Anunnaki, as mentioned in the Bible, possessed six fingers, as there is a reference to a giant with six fingers in 2 Samuel 21.20. Interestingly, even today, there are individuals on our planet who, due to a genetic predisposition, are born with six fingers, six toes, or both. This leads to a speculative inquiry. Could these genetic remnants be attributed to the Anunnaki? The Anunnaki appointed these leaders rather than being themselves Anunnaki. According to certain esoteric sources, an Anunnaki could have a lifespan of 1,000 years and with specific methods to prolong life, likely only available to the privileged few, they could potentially live up to 10,000 years. Enki and Enlil might still exist in some form, perhaps in their multidimensional bodies. Regardless, they would continue to exist as entities, similar to how the human soul persists after the body's death. It is widely acknowledged that the universe is multidimensional, and it is reasonable to assume that the Anunnaki share this characteristic. Similarly, as humans inhabit this multidimensional universe, we also possess this quality, although we are unaware of it due to limitations in our perceptual faculties, restricting us from perceiving only three dimensions. In contrast, the Anunnaki possess conscious access to energies from dimensions beyond our perception, enabling them to derive sustenance from these sources. Furthermore, when present on Earth, they have additional opportunities available to them. When a human on earth dies, their soul departs from the body, releasing the life energies present in the corpse. Entities with a multidimensional consciousness can detect and absorb these energies, whether or not they have taken on a physical form. This process is more convenient when a person dies from violence, as the body retains a significant amount of life energy. However, when someone dies from old age or disease in a weakened body, there is very little life energy remaining, rendering it unappealing to vampiric entities. In addition, humans emit comparable energies when experiencing highly intense negative emotions, particularly extreme anger, fear, panic, or hatred. Entities and other beings existing in multiple dimensions can also derive sustenance from these energies, as well as from sexual desires associated with lust rather than love. Just as a plant can derive nourishment from our bodily waste, they can derive nourishment from our emotional waste. Positive entities directly consume the primordial divine light energy from the original creator, which serves as the fundamental source of sustenance. Conversely, entities like the Anunnaki, who have severed their connection with the original creator, are unable to do so. Instead, they derive nourishment indirectly from the life energies of other living beings, which possess superior access to light energy. As humans, we possess such access by consuming plants, such as vegetables and fruits, that assimilate light energy from the sun and convert it into nutrients through the combination of earthly substances. Alternatively, we may consume animals that have obtained light energy by consuming plants. 
the consumption of carnivorous animals introduces an even more indirect pathway as they have themselves fed on other animals. Have you ever pondered the reason behind the prohibition on consuming meat from carnivorous animals? Vampiric entities similarly obtain light energy indirectly by means of our life energies. It is not surprising that beings like the Anunnaki find pleasure in witnessing violence among humans. They actively incite acts of murder and manslaughter in order to access the life force that is released. From their perspective, we are akin to livestock, referred to as goyim in biblical terms. This also explains the purpose behind animal and human sacrifices. The gods derive no satisfaction from the physical remains of the sacrifices, but rather from the life force that emanates from a body. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, it is recounted that after the flood, Utnapishtim presented a sacrifice to the gods. The sacrificial animal's pleasant aroma attracted the gods, who gathered around it like a swarm of flies. This scene conveys a deeper meaning beyond mere words. The prohibition against consuming blood is elucidated here. Humans are strictly prohibited from partaking in the consumption of blood, as stated in Leviticus 3.17 and 7.27. Instead, animals are to be ritually slaughtered by severing their throats, allowing the blood to drain out, shechita, prior to consuming the meat. The blood is designated for the deities, while the meat is intended for human consumption. Chapter 3 The origins of the Bible can be traced back to the cuneiform texts of Mesopotamia. The Mesopotamian flood stories, including the one in the Bible, indicate a significant connection. Additionally, there are numerous other similarities between them. Now, I will initially analyze the inception of the Bible. The Hebrew text in Genesis 1 states, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim fit haaretz, which is commonly translated as, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Regardless of how one analyses it, it is an indisputable fact that Elohim is the plural form of Eloah, denoting a deity. Consequently, it has been proposed that this term should be interpreted as the deities created. However, this construction is grammatically incorrect, as the verb bara, created, is in the singular form. Theologians often dismiss this issue by attributing it to the plural maestatis, which refers to the use of plural pronouns or verbs to denote the singular majesty of a ruler. While this grammatical form does exist in Hebrew, there is another solution to this problem that requires careful consideration. The conventional and widely accepted translation of Bereshit is derived from the interpretation of be as in or at, and Reshit as beginning. Dictionaries also suggest that Reshit can alternatively signify the first of its kind or the origin. Consequently, the term Bereshit can be understood as a somewhat redundant phrase denoting the original first, the very first, or the primordial creator. Therefore, the subsequent translation aligns with grammatical rules. The first one is responsible for the creation of the gods, the celestial realms, and the earth. Alternatively, we can describe it as the primordial creator being responsible for the creation of the gods, the cosmic worlds, and the earth. In addition, only a small number of translations retain the plural form, the heavens to accurately reflect the original Hebrew word shamayim, which can be understood as cosmic worlds. Therefore, it can be inferred that the created gods refer to the inhabitants of other cosmic worlds, such as planets and other dimensional realms, which encompass extraterrestrial life in general. As previously mentioned, if we consider the Mesopotamian texts to be based on factual information, this implies that the Anunnaki have claimed dominion over a specific region of creation. Consequently, it follows that other regions must exist as well. The presence of perplexing plural forms in the Bible lends some support to this interpretation. For instance, Genesis 1.26 states, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Additionally, Genesis 2.22 says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become one of us to know good and evil. 
Both quotes contain the Hebrew term Elohim, and in the latter quote, even Yahweh, referred to as the Lord, is associated with Elohim. This designation of the biblical deity is quite frequent, providing additional evidence for this interpretation. Several passages in the Bible make reference to gods, such as the verse, Who is like unto thee, zero Lord, among the gods? Exodus 15.11 Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods, for if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. Exodus 23.32.3 Emphasis added here and in the following quotes. Upon their gods also the Lord executed judgments. Numbers 33.4 How could he do that if they do not exist? And many other passages. The Lord was furious about Gentiles sacrificing their children, for even their sons and their daughters they have burned in the fire to their gods. Deuteronomy 12.31 And what did he do then? When the Lord thy God shall have destroyed before thy face the nations, which thou then shalt go in to possess, and when thou shalt possess them and dwell in their land. Deuteronomy 12.29 He sends his hosts to kill them and their children. I have taken the translation destroyed from the Dwayraim's Bible. Other versions of Eli translate Yakrit as cut off from the verb carrot, which also means kill, destroy, and cut down, like a tree. In this case, obviously with swords. Even at the beginning of the translation and study of the Mesopotamian texts, the remarkable correspondences between these stories and the ones in the Bible aroused the attention of ethnologists and linguists, especially concerning the flood. As early as 1876, a publication about this subject appeared by George Smith, The Chaldean Account of Genesis. A little later, a study was issued in the classic work Die Keilinschriften und das Alte Testament, The Cuneiform Inscriptions and the Old Testament, by Eberhard Schrader, with a contribution by Paul Haupt. Another classic treatment of this subject is the contribution of Heinrich Zimmern in the book Schopfung und Chaos in Urzeit und Endzeit, Creation and Chaos in Primaeval Times and in the End Times, by Hermann Gunkel. The Gilgamesh epic and the Old Testament parallels are more recent works on this topic by Alexander Heidel. The reactions to such publications were divided, as could be expected. For devout Christians and Jews, it was impossible that there could be a divine revelation earlier than the Bible. Theologians and rabbis tried by any means to disprove a connection. For them, there could only be three explanations. One, the similarities are fortuitous. Two, the Mesopotamian stories are either replicated or influenced by those found in the Bible. Three, these are autonomous narratives based on actual events. For agnostics and atheists, it was simpler. They regarded the stories as nothing more than fairy tales. Scholars attempted to undermine the connections by highlighting several discrepancies between the stories, but the numerous similarities still stand out. Additionally, the Enuma Elish includes a prehistoric account of Earth's creation and the origins of life on our planet, which is only subtly alluded to in the Bible. The discrepancies between the two accounts are relatively minor. In the clay tablets, the flood was unleashed upon the earth as a means for the gods to attain peace and respite from the humans, who had become a source of annoyance to them. Conversely, in the Bible, the flood was brought about due to the sinful nature of humanity. In the tablet texts, Enki covertly warns Atrahasis, while in the Bible, God directly informs Noah. Additionally, the shape of the ark differs in the two narratives. The tablet texts describe rainfall lasting for seven days, whereas the Bible states that it rained for 40 days. Furthermore, in the Bible, Noah is instructed to repopulate the earth, whereas in the tablet texts, a select group of individuals escapes with a trahasis, leading to the subsequent repopulation of the earth. Both stories involve the dispatch of birds to search for land. In the Bible, a raven returns first, followed by a dove carrying an olive twig. In the Mesopotamian story, a dove and a swallow return, but not the raven.
These are just a few examples of the divergent details between the two accounts. A comprehensive analysis of these similarities was published in 1997 in the periodical Bible and Spade. An organization that believes the Bible to be without error is responsible for producing this publication. Thus, the analysis is conducted from that perspective. It demonstrates that many of the counterarguments against the correspondence theory are contrived. Some individuals may prioritize the quantity of arguments over their quality. Despite these challenges, the analysis provides a thorough overview of the parallels. Besides the flood story, there are many other correspondences between the Bible and the Mesopotamian texts, not least between the Enuma Elish and the biblical creation story in Genesis. Both are based on the concept of primordial energy, which is an entity that, out of itself, created worlds and living beings. In an initial state of chaos and complete darkness, this energy existed. But what is chaos? The word is usually understood to mean complete disorder, but the original meaning is total emptiness. It is derived from the Greek word khan, which means yawn, as in the expression the yawning void and it corresponds to the vabohu in Genesis 1-2, which means waste and void. The primordial chaos was pure energy that, so far, was without content, because no creation, either inside or outside of it, had taken place. In both stories, light emanated from the Creator God. In the Mesopotamian story, this primordial energy is light, and he made worlds come to be. The gods later created humans similar to themselves out of clay or dust. In the end, in the Enuma Elish, the gods are celebrated. In the Bible, God rests. There is a claim that the Hebrew word tehom, which means depth, but can also refer to a body of water or sea in Genesis 1-2, is etymologically connected to Tiamat. However, this claim has been questioned based on linguistic analysis. Heidel believes that the two words share a common origin but have distinct meanings. The Mesopotamian texts contain two distinct narratives regarding the creation of humans, which can also be observed in the Bible. Genesis 1, 26-7 describes the initial creation of humans, stating, And God said, Let us make man in our image. In the biblical account, it is stated that God created man and woman in his own likeness, using the term Elohim, which can be translated as the gods. This creation occurred on the sixth day, signifying that both man and woman were brought into existence simultaneously and on equal footing. Additionally, a second creation of humans is described in Genesis 2.7 and 2.22. Enki possessed a book containing over 100 divine laws and commandments, also referred to as divine powers. These were inscribed on clay tablets, of which only fragments remain today. Some scholars propose that these tablets can be likened to the ones containing the commandments bestowed upon Moses. The deity responsible for these commandments was Enmeshara, a god associated with the underworld and an ancestor of Enki and Enlil who is not mentioned in the Enuma Elish. Enlil collected and presented these tablets to Enki. Adam is not the first human being. He is brought into existence after the seventh day in a different manner. He appears in the second chapter of Genesis. It is mentioned that there was not a man to till the ground, Genesis 2 per 5, but it is possible that there was already a man elsewhere, outside of Eden, with different responsibilities or none at all. Therefore, God forms Adam from the dust of the ground and breathes life into his nostrils. Genesis 2 7. It is not explicitly stated here that Adam is made in the image of God, although this is mentioned in Genesis 5 1. Adam is placed in the Garden of Eden as a sort of caretaker for God. His name initially means man, but it can also have other interpretations. He remains alone until a woman is created for him, much later. Here, the Hebrew word translated as dust is afar. It means something that is pulverized or ground into dust or particles. 
earth as dust of the ground, is Adama. This is explained by the premise that the earth of the Orient is usually reddish, and Adam can also mean red, reddish, or the color of blood. A far-fetched explanation. But the Hebrew word dam means blood. Could we also understand dust of the earth as red blood cells? After all, it would be far-fetched to assume that the raw material for Adam would be dry dust gathered from the ground. If we were to understand this material as the components of blood, we would come close to the Mesopotamian creation story, created out of the blood of a slaughtered god. Blood cells carry genes and with that we come close to Sitchin's theories about a genetic process. Dust of the earth could specifically refer to blood cells of terrestrial origin, maybe from animals or some prehistoric humans, which were then mixed with the genes of the gods. In this context, God is referred to as Yahweh Elohim, rather than simply Elohim, suggesting that he is one of the Elohim, deities that were created, who brings about his own creation. Adam and Eve consumed fruit from the tree of knowledge and were forced to leave Eden. They subsequently had offspring, and their son Cain found a spouse, Genesis 4.17. Cain's descendants also found partners. The question arises, where did these individuals come from? The only plausible explanation is that God, or the deities, had previously created other humans before Adam who were capable of procreation. Genesis 1.28 This clarifies Cain's otherwise perplexing fear that someone might seek retribution for his brother's murder. Genesis 4.14 According to the prevailing dogmatic interpretation, there would be no other individuals who could pose such a threat. His parents, spouse and children would likely not do so. Thus the deities would be the most probable culprits. The Mesopotamian literature features a narrative involving Adapa, who, due to an unfortunate event, was summoned to the dwelling of Anu for interrogation. Eventually, Anu instructs Adapa to return to his earthly realm, stating, bring him back to his place of origin. Anu's abode is not located on earth, some have suggested that this is similar to the biblical story of Adam in Eden, but I find this argument unconvincing. However, I find it noteworthy that at the entrance of Anu's abode, there are two watchers named Tammuz and Gish Zida. Tammuz is the Sumerian deity associated with food, vegetation, and farming, while Gish Zida is the lord of the good tree and healing. These figures bear a resemblance to the two trees in the Garden of Eden. One could also speculate about possible parallels with the two pillars, Jachin and Boaz, at the entrance of Solomon's temple, 1 Kings 7.21. Ryan Moorhen appears to downplay the significance of the numerous correspondences, although an impartial reader would consider them important evidence. This may be attributed to his affiliation with the Christadelphian community, which adheres strictly to the word of God, as written in the Bible. Consequently, any evidence suggesting a Mesopotamian origin of the biblical texts would contradict his personal beliefs. Curiously, certain authors provide a comprehensive analysis of these correspondences and parallels with the purpose of diminishing their significance, yet they still offer valuable material for discussion. Yahweh is the deity mentioned in the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament of the Christian Bible. In written form, it is represented by the consonant YHWH, as its pronunciation is prohibited in Judaism. Instead, the term Adonai is used to refer to this deity. This term is an archaic plural form of Adon, which translates to Lord. There exist multiple hypotheses regarding the appropriate vowels to be assigned to the four consonants. The appellation is also referred to as the Tetragrammaton, or the four letters. Presently, the widely acknowledged theological pronunciation is Yahweh, although a commonly used alternative is Yehoah, which closely resembles the vocalization of Adonai. In Exodus 3.14, the individual clarifies their name as I am that I am. Additional vowels have been incorporated into the name YHWH, resulting in alternative interpretations. For instance, one vocalization, Yahawah, with the letter Vav pronounced as O, could potentially connote 
bringing calamity. Consequently, the identity of this deity becomes a subject of inquiry in the field of religious history, as recent findings by scholars provide insights. However, due to the deeply personal nature of faith-related matters, this topic remains contentious. Archaeological discoveries in recent years have significantly transformed our understanding of the origins of monotheism in the history of religion. It has been revealed that the Hebrew Christian religion, which we now know as monotheistic, was originally polytheistic and included the worship of goddesses. During the period before the 5th century BCE, the primary goddess worshipped was Asherah. However, a shift occurred during the Babylonian exile, 586-539 BCE, leading to the Hebrew religion adopting a rigidly dogmatic monotheistic belief system. As part of this transition, goddesses like Asherah were eradicated and their symbols were deliberately destroyed, reflecting a shift towards a patriarchal society. Is there only one deity? These remarkable results do not indicate that there was no highest god, no primordial creator, in the earliest monotheistic religions. But they do raise the question of whether our monotheistic religions actually relate to that primordial creator, or whether they are pseudo-monotheistic religions that relate to a kind of intermediate god that slipped into the original creator's role, or was inserted into it for political reasons, by gods or by humans. As we have seen, Apsu, and not Anu or Marduk, is the original creator in the Mesopotamian creation story, and in union with Tiamat. These two were devalued and, in a way, dethroned. Other gods pushed themselves in between them and Us. The situation in India is a bit similar, although it is more open. Parabrahman is held to be the highest god but no other deity tries to steal the show from him. If, for example, someone is devoted to Vishnu or Shiva, he knows that the deity is not the primordial creator himself, but being itself created, in a way, represents him. The concept of monotheism, the belief in a single deity, has been deeply ingrained in our minds by the church and religious teachings. Throughout history, the God depicted in the Old Testament has been widely regarded as the sole god. Does this depiction align with historical evidence? Several justifications can be presented to argue that the initial form of the normative WH religion was polytheistic. The town of Ugarit, located in northern Canaan, now known as Ras Shamra, has revealed a diverse polytheistic belief system featuring deities that are also referenced in the Old Testament such as El, Baal, Astarte, Anat, and Asherah. Although the biblical texts can be interpreted as suggesting a peaceful coexistence and merging of EHWH and El, there is strong opposition towards Baal and the female deities. Dietrich refers to archaeological discoveries in Kuntilet Ajrud, now Horvat Timon, and Kirbet El Kom, near Hebron, where inscriptions explicitly mention Yahu and his divine partner, Asherah. These non-biblical written accounts have understandably caused significant controversy among researchers, as Dietrich explains. This rigorous belief in the existence of only one God emerged during the periods of exile in Egypt and Babylon. However, the speaker acknowledges that managing all aspects of the world and human existence can be more challenging for a solitary deity compared to a group of gods. Consequently, numerous distinct entities were established. A large number of angels and demons appear along with the representation of Satan. Additionally, the semi-divine entity known as Lady Wisdom is also part of this framework. In Hebrew, she is referred to as Chokma, while in Greek, she is known as Sophia. Yahweh, originally worshipped as a mountain deity in the southern desert, later became the personal and national deity of the Israelites. This historical development has had significant implications. The strict adherence to monotheism, although promoting a singular belief in God, can sometimes be perceived as intolerant, fanatical, and fundamentalist, leading to negative consequences. 
It is worth noting that both Islam and, to a greater extent, Christianity have historical instances where a belief in God has been used as a justification for various forms of wrongdoing, including acts of genocide. It is important to acknowledge that this observation was made prior to the current acts committed in the name of Islam, which have now surpassed those associated with Christianity. Both archaeological evidence and biblical accounts confirm that the early religion of Israel involved the veneration of goddesses, as mentioned in passages such as Hosea 4, 9-14 and Jeremiah 44, 15-19. However, this worship was eventually supplanted, and all aspects of divinity, including both male and female, positive and negative, and benevolent and malevolent forces, were unified under the worship of Yahweh. There have been individuals who have proposed that Yahweh is simply another designation for the deity known as El. However, this perspective is susceptible to significant criticism. Although the precise origin of Yahweh remains uncertain, there is strong evidence suggesting that he was initially worshipped as the deity of Mount Sinai and also as a god associated with warfare. The 70 nations on earth supposedly worshipped the 70 sons of El, another deity, as gods. Yahweh was one of these sons and specifically served as the god of Israel, as mentioned in Deuteronomy 32.8 and Genesis 10. The assembly of deities is referenced in Psalm 82.1. 6. The divine beings, Elohim, stand in the gathering of the powerful. They pass judgment among the deities. I have proclaimed that you are divine beings, referred to as Elohim, and each one of you is a descendant of the supreme being, known as Arion. Undoubtedly, the name Yahweh is referenced on nearly every page of the Hebrew Bible, specifically a total of 5 the 6 from 58 times. The combination Yahweh Elohim is mentioned 40 times, while Elohim Yahweh is mentioned four times. Additionally, the term Elohim appears 680 times. By subtracting 44 from this figure, we find that Elohim alone is mentioned 636 times. In the Bible, Yahweh initiates the flood to eradicate a morally corrupt human population and commence anew with Noah. This serves as a reset. In the Mesopotamian texts, Enlil triggers the flood to eradicate the entirety of humanity, which has become bothersome to him, while Enki violates a prohibition on speech, enabling a fresh progression of humanity through Atrahasis, Utnapishtim, Ziusudra. Yahweh is a deity associated with warfare and tempestuous weather. The name Enlil, meaning ruler of the storm, also signifies his role as a god of war. Enlil is married to Ninlil, Sud. Initially, Enlil commits a sexual assault against her and later deceives her on two occasions while assuming different identities, revealing a derogatory perspective towards femininity. Yahweh, the deity in question, was initially believed to have a spouse named Asherah. However, it seems that Asherah was eventually disregarded and her name was deliberately omitted from the Bible. This deliberate omission suggests a negative perspective on femininity. Further information about Asherah is provided below. Yahweh may have been involved in intimate relationships with two other goddesses. Enlil's demeanor towards humanity can vary, displaying both amicability and severity, occasionally even bordering on cruelty. He exhibits a tendency to excessively punish humans and inflict calamities upon them. Those who fail to identify the biblical God within Enlil may overlook his presence. Certain depictions of Enlil in Mesopotamian imagery portray him wearing a crown adorned with horns, the term sons of God. In Genesis 6 2 and 6 4, it is stated that the sons of God observed the attractiveness of the daughters of men and married them according to their own preferences. In those times, Colossal beings inhabited the earth. Furthermore, subsequent to this event, when the divine beings engaged in relations with mortal women and offspring were conceived, these offspring grew to become powerful individuals renowned for their ancient lineage. In the Hebrew text, the sons of God are referred to as 
sons of the Elohim, meaning sons of the gods, Bene Ha Elohim. Based on the information provided, it is highly likely that these Elohim were the Anunnaki, and thus the watchers mentioned earlier. The term giants is translated from the word Nephilim, which actually means those who fell down or were thrown down, derived from Raphael, meaning fall or cast down. It is important to note that while the term Nephilim is, alternate translations of the term mighty men include heroes, tyrants, and similar terms. These individuals, known as Giborim, possess exceptional abilities and are also referred to as masterly men. The phrase men who were of old, Hebrew olam, suggests that they may have descended from beings that have existed for an extensive period, likely the Anunnaki. After a prolonged presence on earth, the Anunnaki departed but maintained their authority over us. To accomplish this, they instructed certain individuals, referred to as angels by humans, to remain watchers on our planet. Since the Anunnaki are evidently beings that exist in multiple dimensions, they are capable of concealing themselves in other dimensions, rendering themselves invisible to us. They deliberately designed our DNA to restrict our perception to three dimensions. Although it appears that the Anunnaki left us alone, the Watchers served as a conduit between them and us. However, this communication was one-sided and did not function in reverse. We no longer received information about them, while they remained informed about us. We were unaware of the situation and lacked complete control over ourselves. Instead, they exerted covert control over humans, both on a subconscious and unconscious level. As is recorded in the books of Enoch, as the number of human offspring grew, attractive daughters were born to them. The heavenly beings, known as angels, noticed these daughters and desired them. They decided amongst themselves to take wives from the human population and have children with them. Their leader, Semyaza, expressed concern that he alone would bear the consequences of this sinful act if others did not agree. In response, all of them agreed to swear an oath and bind themselves with curses to ensure the successful execution of their plan. There were a total of 200 angels who descended upon the summit of Mount Hermon, which they named Hermon, meaning fortress, because it was there that they swore their binding oaths. The Watchers, who were celestial beings, procreated with human women, resulting in the birth of giant offspring. These giants were said to have developed a taste for human flesh and sought to consume both humans and animals, along with drinking blood. Additionally, these 200 fallen angels imparted knowledge of various occult practices, such as magic, astrology, geomancy, and metallurgy, to their children and the daughters of men. This excessive transgression prompted God to instruct Uriel to forewarn Noah about an impending flood that would engulf the earth. Consequently, the fallen angels were subsequently confined in the abyss until the Day of Judgment. Within the Hebrew Book of Enoch, also known as Enoch III, the Watchers are alternatively referred to as Erin and Kadishin. In Chapter 5 of the Book of Jubilees, it is stated that God was extremely angry with the angels he had sent to earth. He ordered that they be completely removed from their positions of power and instructed us to imprison them deep within the earth. As a result, they are now confined together and kept apart from each other. Divine authority subsequently issued a decree ordering the use of weapons to punish their male offspring, which resulted in their expulsion from the earthly realm. Following this, a detailed account of catastrophic annihilation is provided, culminating in the occurrence of a flood. The sons of God are primarily depicted in a negative light, although there is an alternative perspective. They had implored God not to create humans on earth, but since he did so anyway, they desired to be in close proximity to them. The Anunnaki, through genetic manipulation, engineered humans to serve as enslaved individuals and intended to keep them in a primitive state to prevent them from gaining too much understanding and remaining obedient. However, it appears that the Watchers showed some compassion for these people 
and tried to raise their consciousness by passing on their own genetic material, albeit out of impure motives. Consequently, the Watchers transgressed a prohibition, which appears to be their true sin. Humans were slated for eradication through a deluge because they were progressing beyond the intended scope and had consumed excessively from the Tree of Knowledge. This essentially denotes an act of ethnic cleansing by God. Chapters 4 and 5 of the Book of Jubilees, an apocryphal text, assert that the Elohim's offspring were responsible for instructing and enlightening humans. Despite fulfilling this duty, they succumbed to the temptation of engaging in sexual relations with earthly women. The true nature of their transgression is questioned. Was it the act of sexuality itself? If so, why do both humans and the Watchers possess sexual organs? If they were not meant to utilize them, why were they given them? In Genesis 1, is it possible that the offspring of the Watchers were giants, in a metaphorical sense, possessing greater intelligence and consciousness than humans were expected to have, in addition to potentially being physically larger? The claim that these giants consumed or enslaved humans could be a false accusation used to justify their annihilation. Anakim, also known as the Sons of Anak, is a term mentioned in the Bible to refer to a group of tall individuals residing in southern Palestine near Hebron and to the east of Jordan. These individuals, also referred to as Rephaim, were believed to wear neck chains and possess elongated necks. Hence, there is an association with the word Anna, meaning necklace or long neck. It is not unreasonable to speculate on a potential etymological link with the Anunnaki. Furthermore, there may be a connection between the sons of Anak and the Nephilim. Although theologians tend to disagree, the name appears in nine biblical passages. Deuteronomy 128, 2.10.11, 2.21, 9.2, .2, Joshua 11.21-22, 14.12, and 14.15. Deities from the Bible and ancient Mesopotamia. There may be objections to the absence of goddesses in the Bible. However, it is worth noting that Yahweh, as mentioned on page 46, was initially believed to have a wife named Asherah. Inscriptions from the earliest forms of Near Eastern religion support this. Some scholars associate Asherah with the Mesopotamian goddess Ishtar, Inanna, who is considered a daughter of Anu. Recently, a large amount of archaeological data has been collected, which suggests the presence of the Asherah cult, dedicated to the ancient Canaanite mother goddess. The endeavours of certain biblical scholars are illuminating in their attempts to evade the unmistakable evidence of Asherah's existence. In some cases, there are efforts to interpret the term Asherah as simply representing a wooden object associated with a religious cult or even a tree without acknowledging the presence of a goddess symbolised by it. The term Asherah appears over 40 times in the Hebrew Bible but it is commonly translated as tree or grove. Archaeologist William G. Deva notes that in at least six instances, Asherah refers to the goddess herself rather than just an object resembling a totem. There is no alternative or solution to it. These are representations of Asherah, specifically 30 figures. There is a specific grammatical issue present in this context. The name is mentioned in 19 verses using a male plural form, Asherim, and in three verses using a female plural form, Asherot. This distinction is based on the Hebrew language's masculine and feminine plural forms. The suffix im denotes the masculine plural form, while the feminine plural form is not. The male form specifically refers to a wooden representation or symbol of Asherah, whereas the female form refers to the goddess herself, along with her associated symbols, hence the plural form. The name Asherah is derived from the word Asher, which means happy. In certain verses of the Bible, there are apparent connections made to Asherah. Regarding Baal, there was an intentional effort to diminish the importance of his worship. Those promoting patriarchy deliberately distanced themselves from Asherah, refusing any association with her. The prohibition against planting a tree at Yahweh's altar 
as mentioned in Deuteronomy 16.21, likely referred to a representation of Asherah, possibly in the form of a wooden figure or pole. The term pole could be a play on words with Asherah's name. The root word Ashar, which means straight or upright, could be linked to the idea of an upright pole symbolizing Asherah. Some individuals even suggest that these upright images were defamatory and could be interpreted as phallic symbols. Unfortunately, contemporary editions of the Bible no longer include a section called the Wisdom of Solomon. However, this text can still be found in certain specialized books of the Apocrypha. In the wisdom literature, there is a complex character known as Lady Wisdom, whose interpretation is not straightforward and can be seen as a deity. The initial followers of Christianity, known as the Gnostics, considered the Holy Spirit to possess a feminine nature. Many scholars seek to establish a connection between this female Holy Spirit and Lady Wisdom, Sophia, Chokma, who is referred to as the Spirit of Wisdom, Ruach, Hikmah, in certain passages of the Old Testament, Exodus 28, 3, Deuteronomy 34, 9, Isaiah 11, 2. According to an apocryphal text, Jesus made reference to my mother, the Holy Spirit. Some theologians attempt to explain the femininity of the Holy Spirit by suggesting that it is a result of the grammatical gender of the Hebrew word for spirit, ruach, which is feminine. However, this explanation appears to be a way of avoiding the issue. Within Judaism, the Holy Spirit is associated with the Shekinah, the female presence of God, which holds significant importance in the Kabbalah. Another deity mentioned in the Bible is Anath, who is also associated with the geographical name Beth Anath, suggesting that she was once worshipped there. In Mesopotamia, she is known as Antu and is one of Anu's spouses. Ashtoreth, known as Ishtar in Mesopotamia, is referred to as a false goddess in three instances in the Bible. However, Atherat, or Ashtoreth, is the Ugaritic name for Asherah, distinct from Ashtarte. The New Testament mentions Artemis, also known as Diana, in some translations. Therefore, the Bible contains more references to divine femininity than proponents of patriarchy may prefer. A special female entity mentioned in the Bible is Lilith. She is seen as a female demon, and in Hebrew mythology, she was the first wife of Adam. She did not feel that he was treating her as an equal, and therefore left him. Then God, Yahweh, created Eve for him. Lilith is feared in Jewish folk belief because she steals children from their mothers after birth. She, however, also plays with children and makes them laugh. In the Bible, she is mentioned in Isaiah 34.14, where the Hebrew text calls her by her name, although translations usually render it as screech owl, night ghost, female demon, goblin, and the like. In Mesopotamia, she is a rather demonic but not entirely negative goddess Lilitu. One might ask what the world would look like if the goddesses had not been banned from our principal religions. There is a soft motherly femininity missing in our macho and patriarchal Old Testament Bible. The world might have been more peaceful and humane had this feminine element been preserved. Of course, the Virgin Mary has taken over some of this role, but she is not a goddess. Besides, Worshipping her seems to have contributed little to the salvation of the world. Even in politics, only male women seem to be tolerated. The return of the goddess may be overdue. Chapter 4 The Anunnaki Deceptive Deities Who Instituted Organized Religion The subsequent passage provides a concise overview of the Gnostic Christian's depiction of the creation as described in the Apocryphon of John alternatively referred to as the secret book of John. The first being is imperceptible and lacks a name characterized by an immeasurable luminosity. He possesses eternal existence and invincibility. By means of his volition, a female companion, Barbello, the origin of her name is disputed. She's also referred to as Pranoia or Providence, emanated from him a radiance equal to his own, the initial cogitation, the fundamental progenitor of creation, the Holy Spirit. 
Through a fragment of the first being, the androgynous autogenes, self-generated, whom we identify as Christ, emerged from her. Subsequently, the four luminous aeons originated from the first being, and Christ with the purpose of serving Christ. The final aeon, known as Eleleth, is associated with Sophia, the embodiment of divine perfection, situated at its outermost boundary. Sophia independently initiated her own creation, which ultimately resulted in the formation of the material world. She attempted to replicate the first being and produced an entity from within herself, similar to how Barbello had generated autogenes. Sophia's intention was to produce offspring, but she did so without consulting the first being. Due to the absence of a male element, an entity emerged that, due to Sophia's imperfection, resembled a dragon or serpent with the face of a lion. This entity was named Yaldabaoth, possibly derived from the Aramaic phrase Yalda Bahut, meaning son of chaos. Overwhelmed with shock and shame, Sophia initially concealed Yaldabaoth in a cloud and subsequently expelled it from the Pleroma, the realm of divine perfection. Yaldabaoth escaped to the lower regions. As a result of losing the favor of the first being, Sophia came to be known as Norea. She later incarnated as the daughter of Adam and Eve. However, it is believed that the sons Cain and Abel were conceived because Yaldabaoth violated Eve. The first legitimate child of Adam was Seth. In this chapter, the issue of rape is once again presented, as we have previously observed in the preceding chapter, where Enlil forcibly had sexual intercourse with his spouse, Ninlil. It is worth noting that Yaldabaoth is the Gnostic term used to refer to Yahweh. In Genesis 4.1, the following statement is made, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, Yahweh. However, it is possible to interpret the Hebrew text as follows, And Adam knew that she had become pregnant and bore Cain, and she said, I have acquired a man with Yahweh. This interpretation is highly controversial, but it does align with the narrative. Yaldabaoth, despite being weak, seized power from his mother and harbored a strong desire for more authority. He dispatched twelve entities known as Archons to govern the territories he had claimed, and he also purportedly brought into existence 365 angels to serve as his aides. Displaying his arrogance, he proudly declared to the Archons, I am the sole God, and there exists no other deity beside me. Hence, he is commonly referred to as Samael, denoting his aversion to perceiving reality. Additionally, he is known as Saklas, a term occasionally associated with Satan, signifying foolishness. The physical substance materializes within his dominion. The realm of Yaldabaoth exists in the shadowy realms, where he allows the purloined radiance of Sophia to illuminate. Consequently, this realm is neither luminous nor obscure, but rather dim. Its inhabitants have grown accustomed to this subdued illumination and remain oblivious to the existence of a more brilliant light. Due to Sophia's remorse, the first being attempted to salvage her distorted creation. A voice startled the archons, and they went in search of its source. Yaldabaoth, upon seeing a reflection of the first being in the water, an energy barrier separating the divine realm from Yaldabaoth's realm, made an unsuccessful attempt to mimic it. Yaldabaoth managed to diminish Sophia's radiance by appropriating a portion of it. Nevertheless, she was able to compel Yaldabaoth to create Adam and infuse a fraction of his wrongfully acquired spiritual essence into him. Upon realizing Adam's inherent superiority, Yaldabaoth and the Archons experienced remorse for their act of creation and desired to eliminate him. However, they were unable to do so. They confined him within the Garden of Eden, a seemingly idyllic realm. In this domain, they permitted him to partake in the Tree of Life, yet prohibited him from accessing the tree of knowledge, which pertained to luminous energies originating from a higher realm that Adam was not meant to comprehend. Yaldabaoth desired to seize the divine illumination within Adam and extract it from him. 
However, Eve emerged, dispatched from the celestial realms. Adam perceived a reflection of himself in Eve, liberating him from Yaldabaoth's curse. It was Christ who, by means of Eve's intervention, facilitated Adam's consumption of the Tree of Knowledge. Yaldabaoth endeavoured to regain dominion over the essence of illumination. To achieve this, he initiated the procedure of human procreation with the aim of creating new human bodies inhabited by counterfeit spiritual energies. These deceptive forces were intended to entice and deceive the human race, ensuring their ignorance and submission to Hin One. This serves as the origin of all malevolence and perplexity, preventing humans from discovering the truth and recognizing the genuine deity. Certain editions of the Apocryphon of John also make reference to the flood. Yaldabaoth, feeling remorse for having created humans who possessed certain qualities that surpassed his own, desired to unleash the flood upon them. Thus far, we can establish the following speculative comparisons. The first beings are Little, Barbelo Apsu, and Tiamat. The descent of Yaldabaoth into obscure realms, the rebellion of the initial Anunnaki. Yaldabaoth assumes the role of God by distancing himself from the first being and Barbelo. He claims responsibility for the destruction of Apsu and Tiamat in order to make the Anunnaki abandon their allegiance to them. Apsu desires to undo the process of human creation. Enlil's contempt for humans prompts a desire to reverse their creation. Kishar, the third deity in the Enuma Elish, is commonly associated with the concept of Mother Earth. While it is still being determined whether she can be compared to Sophia, the lack of information in Mesopotamian texts makes this a speculative matter. Nevertheless, Kishar predates the Anunnaki and is recognized as the mother of Anu. Consequently, she is Enlil's grandmother, as Enlil's mother, Ki, was one of Anu's consorts. Alternatively, there may be a connection between Kishar, Norea, and Sophia afterwards. The Gnostic texts can be directly compared to Genesis 2, revealing a clear identification between Yaldabaoth and Yahweh, also known as Enlil. Yaldabaoth and his archons are considered to be the Anunnaki. This correlation provides an explanation for the extreme acts of cruelty attributed to God in the Old Testament. When comparing the Old Testament with Mesopotamian texts, it is important to note that the Bible is biased towards Yahweh and presents a favorable portrayal of everything related to Enlil Yahweh. In contrast, the Gnostic texts are critical of Yahweh and depict him in a different light. Consequently, these later texts, using their own language, provide descriptions of creation processes that occurred before the appearance of Yaldabaoth Yahweh, which are either omitted or intentionally excluded from other texts by the scribes. An exposition of the hypothesis regarding Yaldabaoth. Origen, a prominent figure in the early Christian church during the 2nd and 3rd centuries, was not agnostic but shared many similarities with them. His perspective on the world aligns closely with that of Gnostic Christians and can be considered comprehensive from their point of view. Origen posited the existence of twelve distinct levels within the universe. The divine light that comes from the original creator occupies the highest level. Below that, there are nine hierarchies of angelic beings. Humans live in the eleventh level, while enemies and demons live in the twelfth level. According to Origen, we, in the beginning, were all on the first and highest level as children of light, who then developed and grew up. After a time, many of these children became weary of existence in the light, which had become monotonous for them. Only light and love and nothing else. Therefore, they wanted to go out of their way to have experiences that they could not otherwise have. 4. The opportunities for them to fully exercise their free will, which God had granted them, were few in the light. The light beings were so closely connected, and yet individual, that they partook directly of the other's feelings. If a child of the light did something that hurt another, it would immediately feel the pain. Other being, a kind of instant karma. For that reason, they did not do all that they could have done, 
but some wanted to try out other possibilities. This was another reason for them to want to go out of the way. The Creator God said something like, This is not a good idea, but because you do have free will, I will let you have it. Then he contracted himself, generating a region outside of the light. This region grew increasingly dark as it proceeded from the light. Compare the Kabbalistic idea of Tzimtzum, contraction or constriction. In that region, new worlds formed, especially the 11th and 12th levels mentioned above, that is, those of the humans and the demons. A large number of those who wanted to go out of the light became souls and were put into bodies like prisons. 6. After this, through reincarnation they went from one embodiment to another until they became mature enough to return to the light world and stay there without having to incarnate again. One may then ask if the emergence of Yaldabaoth really was an accident in creation, because the Creator God could hardly let a mistake occur. As an answer to this question, I had the following intuitive inspiration, which I want to describe here as a hypothesis. In the beginning, the darker regions were empty, and some organization or structure was needed before the light children could go there. For that purpose, a suitable administrator needed to come into existence, but it could not be a light being from a higher level, because then the outer region would no longer be truly dark. To serve as a first barrier between light and dark, an entity was needed in whom the light was concealed and who was unconscious of it, just as it is for all of us in this dark region we live in, but we do not know it. When we are used to the dimness and know nothing else, it seems to be light to us. This entity was Yaldabaoth, who first went out in the darkness and made worlds there where light children could dwell. Since light is life, we all have the light inside, or we would not live, but most of us do not know it. The topic of discussion is Yaldabaoth and Jesus. Yaldabaoth is regarded as an inadvertent occurrence or mistake in the process of creation. The Gnostic text, the Gospel of Truth, explicitly refers to him as such. By means of this, the gospel of the one who is sought after, which was disclosed to those who have attained perfection through the benevolence of the Father, the concealed enigma, Jesus, the Christ, illuminated those who were in a state of ignorance. He imparted knowledge to them, he revealed a path, and that path represents the ultimate reality that he instructed them about. As a result, Error became furious with him, pursued him relentlessly, was greatly troubled by him, and ultimately failed. Jesus was crucified on a tree as he possessed knowledge that Yaldabaoth wanted to keep hidden from humanity. As a result, Gnostic Christianity, which originated from Jesus' inner circle, was later suppressed and its texts were hidden until they were rediscovered in Nag Hammadi, Egypt, in 1945. When Jesus spoke of the Father, he was likely referring to the highest creator rather than Yahweh. There needs to be more clarity concerning the discussion of prehistory in Mesopotamian texts. These texts briefly mention the period before the creation of the Anunnaki, which is not found in the Bible. Christ would have existed before the Anunnaki. The only entity in this story that could be compared to Christ is Mumu, who emerged directly from the primordial creator pair, Apsu Tiamat. However, the Mesopotamian texts provide very little information about Mumu, making a comparison impossible. The Enuma Elish and other texts only focus on the story of the Anunnaki and Christ, Autogenes, from an external perspective, which suggests that he may not be mentioned in these texts. Similar to the absence of mention of parallel lines of development that led to other civilizations, the Tree of Creation holds numerous unknown branches. Although initially portrayed as a mischievous character in the Enuma Elish, it is important to consider this in the context of Anunnaki's strategy of reversing the concept of good and bad, as mentioned earlier. Tablet 7 presents Mumu as the one responsible for creating heaven and earth, rather than as a collaborator with Apsu and Tiamat. Mumu is also depicted as a benefactor and guardian of humans who upholds and preserves the celestial realm and the underworld. In each case, there is a trinity consisting of Apsu Tiamat Mumu, first being Barbello Autogenes, and God Holy Spirit Christ. 
Regarding Gnostic Christianity, contemporary theology recognizes two distinct perspectives, as outlined in the esteemed German reference work, Theologische Realencyclopädie. The conventional German school posits that Gnostic Christianity originated from a pre-Christian Gnosis and, as a result, is not authentically Christian. However, the Anglo-Saxon and French schools consider the notion of an origin in pre-Christian Gnosis speculative. They maintain that none of the texts provide evidence for the existence of pre-Christian Gnosis or any earlier phases. Today, thanks to the groundbreaking works by Carsten Kolpe, the German perspective has shifted towards the latter. Modern theologians even exhibit a certain sympathy for Gnostic Christianity, albeit limited and secretive. Consequently, it is no longer accurate to claim that Gnostic Christians were not genuine Christians. Key Attributes of Gnostic Christianity This perspective embraces radical dualism, perceiving the world as inherently malevolent and subject to the dominion of antagonistic forces. An elucidation of the distinction between the enigmatic, transcendent, and authentic deity and the demiurge or creator of this realm, Yahweh. The belief that humans, at their core, are fundamentally equal to the divine. A mythical tale of a prehistoric catastrophe explains the current state of humanity. The concept is that human beings attain liberation through the acquisition of a profound understanding of their inherent essence and its celestial source via Gnosis. The final characteristic, incidentally, is unrelated to the concept of self-liberation, which is disdained by ecclesiastical theology. This notion suggests that certain esoteric movements are capable of achieving liberation on their own, which is false. Only methods prescribed by the supreme deity can lead to true liberation. Otherwise, it would not be considered liberation. The term Gnostic originates from the Greek word norizo, meaning to reveal or make known. Consequently, it denotes individuals who possess knowledge and understanding within the Christian context. Conversely, one might be inclined to label those who lack such knowledge as ignorant Christians, or refer to them as adherents of a diluted form of Christianity. The Pauline doctrine, therefore, not only deviates from the teachings of Jesus, but also pertains to the peripheral circle surrounding him, wherein certain significant matters were left unspoken. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot be our them now. John 16, 12. Prior to Paul's commencement of preaching, there was a thriving Christian movement known as Gnostic Christianity. This form of Christianity was closely connected to the inner circle surrounding Jesus, as evidenced by the Gnostic texts that were rediscovered in the 20th century. Consequently, the Gnostic Christians possessed knowledge that Jesus did not publicly disclose, but only shared with his disciples. It was these Gnostic Christians that Paul opposed during the time when he still identified himself as Saul, who is the devil. The term originates from the Greek word diabolos, which signifies both a slanderer and an accuser, as well as someone who divides and throws through. He is commonly referred to as Satan, derived from the Hebrew word Satan, which denotes an opponent, adversary, or accuser. Who is this individual? In Job 1.6, he is referred to as one of the sons of the Elohim. In the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, also known as the Second Book of Enoch, the Vevan, he is identified as Satanael, Satanael, and is described as one of the watchers Nephilim who were expelled from heaven. Here are three thought-provoking quotes. The perplexing obscurity and ambiguity in God's nature arise from his role as the originator of both malevolence and benevolence, Lamentations 3.38, vitality and demise, illumination and obscurity, Isaiah 45-7, and joy and sorrow, Amos 3.6. From our perspective, the concepts of beauty and cruelty are intricately intertwined in nature and history. According to their critics, these heretics use different terms to refer to the Abrahamic God, such as a demiurgus, 
an evil angel, the devil god, the prince of darkness, the source of all evil, the devil, a demon, a cruel, wrathful, warlike tyrant, Satan, and the first beast of the book of Revelation. Regarding the paradoxical assertion that both light and darkness, salvation and calamity, originate from YHWH, Isaiah 45-7, does this resolve the issue, or does it concede to its complexity? What is the issue being discussed in this context? The issue of good and evil, particularly evil, raises the question of how Yahweh can embody both. Does he act as his own opponent? Given that he already assumes the identity of the Creator, he could also seize control of the position of the adversary. By stating, You require neither a deity nor a malevolent being, solely my presence, as I embody both, this is a shrewd maneuver. According to biblical and other sources, Satan is described as a conceited and haughty angel who believed himself to be superior to God. As a consequence, he was expelled from the heavenly realm of illumination and cast into a state of darkness. There are similarities to assertions found in different texts, suggesting that Yahweh and Satan are in fact identical, allowing one to interpret Satan as a hidden aspect of Yahweh. It's possible that the conceited celestial being is the Yaldabaoth entity that the Gnostic Christians revere. The devil, whether referred to as Satanael or Satan, was cast down due to his excessive pride and self-importance. This is evident in his declaration, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Isaiah 14, 13 to 14. Here a question arises. Are Satan and Yahweh indistinguishable, as certain Gnostic texts may imply, or is he considered one of the archons? Following their descent, he had the potential to transform into an archon with a profound connection to Yahweh. They play an intriguing game collectively. Satan assumes the role of an adversary to Yahweh with the Machiavellian intention of employing the strategy of divide et impera, or divide and conquer. There are two possible paths, the path of Yahweh and the path of Satan, both leading to the same outcome. Many individuals are choosing one of these routes to reach their destination. Under those circumstances, it would be a shrewd strategy, invoking a sense of autonomy that ultimately does not exist. Is that the solution? In that scenario, none of the methods are authentic. The genuine one, so to speak, is the path that surpasses their understanding. Who is Lucifer? Isaiah 14.12 of the King James Bible states, How have you descended from heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning? How have you been brought down to the ground, weakening the nations? Emphasis added. Luther's translation of the text from German states, How have you fallen from heaven, you splendid celestial body? How have you been cast down, you who weaken the pagans? Other translations include references to a radiant star, a celestial body of the day, and a luminous entity. Most commonly, a morning star or something similar is mentioned. Lucifer is present in only a limited number of translations here. The Hebrew term translated as Lucifer, or a star, is Hel, which means the shining one, and is derived from the word Helal, meaning to shine, boast, or be foolish. Isaiah 14.12 can be more precisely understood as referring to a being described as the shining one, or son of the dawn. The connection with the morning star is an interpretation, as is the translation of the term Lucifer. The exact meaning of the Shining One remains uncertain. The name Lucifer does not appear in the Bible. Lucifer, meaning carrier or bringer of light, is simply the Latin rendition of the name Halel and does not even function as a proper name. In the Greek New Testament, the term used for translation is either Phosphorus, referring to the bringer of light, or Phosphorus, referring to the bringer of dawn. 
Several ancient texts mention the phrase son of Shahar. In the Ugaritic pantheon, Shahar represents the deity associated with dawn, while his brother Shalim represents the deity associated with dusk. They are the offspring of El and are considered the deities of Venus. One of the angels, who was once part of the angelic hierarchy but rebelled against it, had an audacious idea to elevate his throne above the earth's clouds in an attempt to attain a position of equal authority to mine. I expelled him along with his angels from a great altitude, causing him to soar through the air above the abyss without interruption. The passage referenced is from the Book of Secrets of Enoch, alternatively known as the Second Book of Enoch, specifically verses 29, 3 to 4, 18. When examining Luke 10, 18, we find Jesus stating that he witnessed Satan descending from heaven like a bright flash. In the Greek text, the term used is Satanas, but it is uncertain which word Jesus actually used in his native language. The Greek word is a translation from an Aramaic text that is currently unavailable to us. Is there a distinction between Satanael, Satan, and the individual referred to as Lucifer? A potential clue suggests that Satanel, the Lucifer who has not fallen, possessed hidden wisdom, while Satan perverted it. Therefore, could Satan be the Lucifer who has fallen? In Bogomilism, a Gnostic movement that emerged in the late first millennium CE, Satanael was believed to be the entity responsible for the creation of the physical world, along with all its associated anguish and distress. According to their beliefs, Satanael created Adam and Eve, and later took the form of a serpent to engage in sexual relations with Eve, resulting in the birth of the twins Cain and Calamina. Satanael oppressed humanity and deceived them into worshipping him instead of the true God, bearing a resemblance to the figure of Yaldabaoth. Here, there is confusion between Satan and Lucifer. This perplexing situation undoubtedly presents a challenging task to comprehend. What is your opinion or knowledge regarding angels? The term angel originates from the Greek word angelos, which means message, envoy, and has a Hebrew equivalent. Angels are typically perceived as either male or lacking a specific gender, primarily due to Jesus' statement in Mark 12, 25, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. However, being unmarried does not necessarily imply a lack of gender. Female angels are mentioned in Zechariah 5, 9. Then I looked up and saw two women coming forward with the wind in their wings. They had wings like those of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between earth and sky. An ephah is a unit of volume and a measuring vessel, but in Hebrew it could also be the feminine form of a word, meaning darkness. Some people believe that the angel Gabriel can be seen as feminine, despite this idea being considered taboo in patriarchal theology. In Islamic tradition, there is a negative perception of Gabriel because it is believed that he or she used physical violence to compel Muhammad, who was illiterate at the time, to read and write the Quran. However, in Luke 1 26, 38, Gabriel appeared to Mary to inform her about the upcoming birth of Jesus, which is seen as a positive event. Some argue that these two instances involve different entities, suggesting that a demon disguised as Gabriel, Jibra'il, was involved in the story about Muhammad. The Gnostic text, Pistis Sophia 21, mentions that Christ, Autogenes, took on the form of Gabriel to avoid being recognized by the archons of Yaldabaoth, who mistook him for Gabriel. It is said that Christ then found Mary, who is called my mother, after taking on the appearance of Gabriel. Certain authors equate the notion of angels with extraterrestrial beings, particularly the Anunnaki. This association can be extended to the Watchers or the Archons of Yaldabaoth, as well as the angels supposedly formed by him. While some may consider these beings as fallen angels, it is undeniable that numerous benevolent multidimensional extraterrestrials and luminous entities exist in higher realms. Enki and Enlil are ancient Mesopotamian deities. 
they are prominent figures in the Sumerian and Babylonian mythologies. Enki is known as the god of wisdom, water, and creation, while Enlil is considered the god of wind, storms, and agriculture. Enki and Enlil are ancient deities whose identities have been subject to scholarly analysis. Based on the research of Morhen and others, it is highly likely that Enlil is the deity referred to as Yahweh in the Bible. The question remains, however, as to the nature of the more compassionate Enki. Some theories propose that Enki could be associated with Lucifer, although it is important to note that this would differentiate him from Satan. Morhen states that in Sumerian, the term Shatam refers to a high-ranking official responsible for governing the god's territory, specifically Enlil. However, this information leads to a state of perplexity. Enlil strongly opposed the creation of humans on earth and desired to eliminate them through a catastrophic flood. However, despite Enki's intervention that allowed many humans to survive, Enki aimed to keep them in a state of underdevelopment, ignorance and foolishness to ensure their unquestioning obedience. Seeking to be revered as their deity, Enki sought to control humans through instilling fear, intimidation, and a thirst for power. He believed he had the power to control the humans that Enki had created because he thought of himself as being superior to Enki. This conflict led him to defame Enki, depicting him as a serpent and a malevolent being and forbidding any interaction between humans and Enki. Nevertheless, Enki managed to evade this prohibition and has imparted various methods to humanity for elevating their consciousness. The situation has been intentionally complicated to hinder clarity. Contrary to what Yawistic interests would have you believe, Lucifer and Satan are separate entities. Lucifer, in fact, opposes Yahweh, while Satan is the concealed aspect of Yahweh. Some argue that Lucifer is not inherently malevolent but has been depicted as such for political motives. This portrayal stems from the fact that Lucifer bestowed forbidden knowledge and enlightenment upon humans thereby obstructing Yahweh's intentions. The concerning aspect in this particular situation is that various human organizations identify themselves as Luciferian, but their rituals, magic, and even sacrifices exhibit clear characteristics of Satanism. Additional information on this topic can be found on the internet. Some of these organizations audaciously label themselves as Luciferian Gnostics, which should not be mistaken for Christian Gnostics in any way. The names Lucifer and Satan have been intentionally interchanged for strategic purposes. However, a few of these organizations, upon initial observation, may give the impression of being respectable and morally upright. This deliberate ambiguity and confusion undoubtedly serve the interests of Yahweh and a pseudo-Christian church, aiming to persuade people that Lucifer and Satan are synonymous. Could Yahweh be using this as a deliberate ploy to sow doubt and confusion? Such tactics may have even contributed to the emergence of two distinct concepts of Lucifer, one that is independent and another that is identical to Satan. The increasing rumors of Satanism in the Vatican are cause for concern. In 1999, an Italian book titled Gone with the Wind in the Vatican was published under the pseudonym I Milanari which stirred up a great deal of agitation. It is believed that a group of individuals within the church hide behind this pseudonym for protection. Although legal action was taken against them, only one person could be identified. In 2001, the group published another book called Smoke of Satan in the Vatican, which claims that secret satanic rituals and worship take place within the Vatican. It is rumored that nuns resorted to stealing the book from Italian bookshops due to their reluctance to openly purchase it. The Exalté prayer, recited in the Vatican during Easter, contains a disquieting passage. May Lucifer, I say, Lucifer of the morning, who never sets, find these flames, Christ your Son, who has ascended from the depths, has shone his peaceful light on humanity, and lives and reigns with you in ages and ages. The question arises whether the mention of Lucifer in this context refers to Satan, implying their identity as one entity, or if it is connected to the intentional confusion of names mentioned earlier. Some argue that in this context, Lucifer is a reference to the morning star, or day star, 
which is also associated with Christ. Therefore, we have two possible interpretations of the morning star, Lucifer and Christ. The faithful would interpret it as referring to Christ, but given the previous discussion, there is some room for doubt. This is especially true considering the presence of satanic symbols in the Vatican, including an upside-down cross on the Pope's chair. Satan and Yaldabaoth both descended from the divine realm. Similarly, Sophia, after losing favour with the first being, brought illumination to the darker areas and assumed the name Norea. It is worth considering whether Yaldabaoth is synonymous with Satan, and if Norea is connected to the actual Lucifer. Given that Lucifer is also referred to as Venus, the morning star, this association may be plausible. Enki, who opposed the plans of Enlil Yahweh, could be seen as a benevolent figure who brings enlightenment. Some have suggested that Enki and Satan are one and the same, but this does not align well with Enki's character. It seems more plausible to view Enki as a bringer of light while considering Enlil and Satan to be synonymous. Shedding light in the midst of darkness is considered positive. If someone were assigned such a task, Enlil or Yahweh would likely vilify them as a devil. Although Enki may appear hesitant, this does not mean he would not act in his own self-interest. This could be another trap along the journey. While we have some ideas to ponder, we are unable to delve deeper into the interconnections and relationships among these entities, leaving it as an unresolved matter. However, it is worth contemplating the following. Each malevolent entity aspires to masquerade as a divine being, and every divine being labels their adversary as malevolent. This dynamic is mirrored on both sides. The portrayal of an enemy holds political utility due to the potent influence of fear as a means of manipulation. When humans are gripped by fear, they become susceptible to any form of exploitation. Who are the Archons? Much has been written and said about the Archons in Gnostic Christianity. Who are they? Yaldabaoth is called the Chief Archon, and he created seven Archons to serve him. They are also called the Hebdomad, the Seven. The word archon is Greek and means high officer, although in another context it also means origin or principle. These archons are agents of Yaldabaoth, working with him in his creations. The archons created seven powers and 365 angels. In that case, the latter do not really belong to the angels of light. They are spiritually primitive and envy humans for our souls, abilities and talents even though we use these only to a limited extent. They want to restrict our abilities, obstruct our activities, and manipulate us, so that we will not eat from the tree of knowledge. They maintain a false world in which they want to shield us from the true reality. An important aim of Gnostic Christianity is to bypass the Archons after death and go beyond and above them, since they want to keep us in this world to incarnate here again. They also feed on our life energies and emotional energies. This description unequivocally establishes that the Archons are synonymous with the Anunnaki. The Significance of the Snake in Symbolism The snake or serpent is commonly associated with malevolence, yet it also represents sagacity, vitality, healing, fertility, and safeguarding sacred sites. Enki, in particular, is depicted with a symbol consisting of two snakes intricately intertwined in a spiral pattern. In the Bible, the snake enticed Eve to partake of the tree of knowledge, resulting in her and Adam's spiritual awakening. The Apocryphon of John contains the following inscription. However, the tree referred to as the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is the epinoia of the light, was brought about by me in such a way that they consumed it. And I, John, inquired of the Saviour, Lord, was it not the serpent that instructed Adam to partake in consumption? The Saviour responded with a smile, stating that the serpent influenced Adam and Eve to partake in sinful acts of procreation, desire, and ruin, in order to exploit Adam for his own benefit. Adam became aware of his disobedience towards the chief archon as a result of the enlightening epiphany within him, 
which enhanced his cognitive accuracy compared to that of the chief archon. And the latter desired to exert the authority that he had bestowed upon him. He induced amnesia in Adam. I inquired of the Saviour, What is the nature of forgetfulness? He stated that the manner in which Moses wrote and you heard is not accurate. In his initial publication, the author stated, He caused him to enter a state of unconsciousness. Genesis 2.21 although this was based on his own interpretation. Furthermore, he proclaimed by means of the prophet, I will burden their hearts so that they are unable to focus and perceive. Is 6.10. Additionally, this may entail restricting their perception to three dimensions. There is a belief among some that the snake in the Garden of Eden is connected to Enki. However, the quote from the Apocryphon of John suggests that the snake does not necessarily represent evil, but rather has a dual meaning, because it acted in accordance with the will of Christ. The quotation is reminiscent of another pseudepigraphical Old Testament text, The Life of Adam and Eve. Here shortened, the devil told the snake that he had heard that it would be cleaner than other animals. He had a plan to have Adam and Eve driven out of paradise. The snake replied that it feared the wrath of God. The devil reassured it by saying he would speak through its mouth. Eve then saw the snake hanging on the wall around paradise. It asked Eve what she ate. She replied that she ate everything except from the tree in the middle of the park. The snake lamented her foolishness and said that if humans ate from it they would become like gods. God had forbidden them to eat from it because he was jealous. Then. Eve let the snake come into paradise. It did not want to let her eat the fruit before she swore that she would also give it to Adam to eat. The snake poisoned the fruit with greed and wickedness and gave it to her. When Eve had eaten it, she discovered that she was stripped of the righteousness that had before surrounded her like glory. All the leaves of the trees had fallen down, and only the fig tree, the tree from which she had eaten, had kept its leaves from which Eve made an apron. She called Adam and persuaded him that he would be like God and realize good and evil, and he ate. Adam now understood what had happened and reproached Eve for it. It is impossible to determine which specific word in the original Aramaic text, which no longer exists, has been translated as devil in this context. However, when comparing it to the Gnostic text, the Apocryphon of John, it can be inferred that there is a deliberate reversal of good and evil here. The author of this text firmly believed that the true God was Yahweh Enlil. Therefore, anyone who opposes Yahweh Enlil and seeks to free Adam from a monotonous existence will be considered a devil from the author's perspective. It is worth noting that the devil is always portrayed as being on the opposing side. According to George Morhen, Enki, the creator of humanity, had a disagreement with his brother Enlil regarding the elevation of Adam and Eve. Enki became aware that Enlil would vigorously promote a malicious campaign against him, portraying him as a serpent and an evil snake. The veracity of the message conveyed by the snake is affirmed in the Bible itself, as stated, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Genesis 3.22 emphasis added. In Hebrew, the term nachash refers to a snake, but it also carries the meanings of interpret, discover, and decode. On the other hand, saraf specifically denotes a venomous snake. The term seraphim is derived from this word and represents a group of radiant angels, often described as winged snakes, although this etymology is subject to debate, possibly due to some objections. Additionally, when pronounced differently, Natchez also means shining. The Opites or Narsens, a marginal group within Gnosticism, held great reverence for the snake due to its cunning way of outwitting Yahweh in the Garden of Eden and guiding Eve and Adam towards enlightenment. Furthermore, the term tree of knowledge, when accurately translated from Hebrew, actually refers to the tree of wisdom. Jesus instructed his followers, I am sending you out like vulnerable sheep among dangerous adversaries. Therefore, be shrewd and cunning like serpents, yet innocent and gentle like doves. 
Matthew 10.16. It is unjust to slander the Gnostics solely based on their association with snakes. Instead, they exhibit the qualities of simplicity and innocence, akin to doves. Gnostic distortions. Luciferian. Gnosticism is a distorted form of Gnosticism that is unrelated to the original and authentic Gnostic Christianity. There is a significant amount of misinformation surrounding Christian Gnosticism, which is likely intended to protect established power structures and divert attention from threatening truths. Only the ancient Gnostic texts from the first centuries should be considered reliable. Even during that time, various versions of Gnostic Christianity emerged, such as Scythian Gnosticism, which is associated with Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. Refer to page 55 for more information on Cain, Abel, and Seth. Certain individuals spreading false accusations suggest that Seth is the same as the ancient Egyptian god Seth, who is widely considered a malevolent figure. Who is the individual in question? Who is the creator? There is believed to be a single true creator, referred to as El Elyon, the highest god, by the Canaanites. Archaeological findings suggest that this knowledge was significant in Canaan, which was considered a vital part of the Promised Land. According to these sources, Enlil Yahweh, mentioned in the texts, aimed to conceal this truth from humanity in order to present himself as the sole deity. This is why Yahweh guided the Hebrews back to Canaan and commanded them to eliminate its inhabitants, the reasons behind these events, and how the Hebrews, initially arrived in Canaan, are subjects of inquiry. The origin of Judaism was the covenant between Abraham and Yahweh, Genesis 15. Abraham and his family lived in Ur, in Sumer. The Bible tells us in ancient versions that their ancestors had generations earlier come to Sumer from the east, Genesis 11:2. After the covenant, Yahweh led them, the original Hebrews, from the city of Ur in Chaldea to the region of the land of Canaan, Genesis 11, 28, 31, where they obviously preserved Mesopotamian knowledge. Much later, many of them were led to Egypt because of a famine, Genesis 12, 10. There, they were treated as a secondary class, and Yahweh used their misery to lead them back to Canaan, ostensibly for their salvation. Did he do all this to eradicate ancient knowledge through mass brainwashing or ethnic cleansing? He actually had the Hebrews kill their relatives, who were descended from the same ancestors. Many later versions of the Bible state that the ancestors of Abraham would have come from the West, indicating that they originally may have come from Canaan and then returned there. An interesting book supports the hypothesis that the origin of the Hebrews was Sumerian and questions from where they had originally come, from Sumer to Jerusalem, the forbidden hypothesis by John Sassoon. I thoroughly searched for this book in several European university libraries and had to buy it. The hypothesis is apparently forbidden in the academic world. It shows that the Hebrews in Ur probably did not come there from the West, as most of today's Bible translations allege, but moved westward to come to Ur, that is, from the East, from Persia. Nevertheless, it is plausible that they introduced Canaan to cultural and intellectual influences that had their roots in Sumer or even earlier civilizations from the Far East. This cultural exchange included a religious belief system centered around Yahweh, which posed a challenge to his aspirations of monopolizing the position of the supreme deity. Consequently, it served his agenda to eliminate this culture and replace its inhabitants with individuals who had lost this knowledge throughout their generations in Egypt. Additional extraterrestrial influences on humanity. As previously stated, the Enuma Elish and other creation narratives suggest the existence of additional deities and realms within the universe, inhabited by humans and civilizations, beyond the dominion of the Anunnaki where we reside. Is there any evidence of these beings visiting Earth and leaving tangible evidence behind? The abrupt emergence of advanced civilizations that reappeared later on may prompt us to speculate about potential assistance in development from extraterrestrial sources, although it is improbable that such aid was provided without self-interest. Scientists, due to their narrow perspective, reject the existence of Atlantis and Lemuria 
but lack concrete evidence to disprove it. Its truthfulness is disregarded simply because it contradicts the prevailing consensus. Nevertheless, there are indications that these civilizations did exist and may have encountered extraterrestrial influences.